audience um, attendees before we start the meeting. in progress. So okay. Um, good evening. It's May 20th, 2024, and we have two meetings tonight. The first is the special town council and finance committee meeting. Um, I'm going to call that meeting to order and continue on. The open meeting law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at the meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and as a live broadcast on Amherst Media, channel nine. It is also available on live stream. There are in fact nine counselors in the town room this evening. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the May 2024 special town council and finance committee meeting to order at 632. I'll call upon each counselor by name, then have in, then have them indicate that they uh, are present by unmuting their mic and saying present. Please remember to mute your mic. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Um, present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Councillor Ette. Not present yet. Lynn Griesmer's present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord is absent. Uh, Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Uh, Jennifer Taub. Here. <laughs> Councillor Walker. Okay. Um, there's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know. Before I do that, however, and to proceed, I'd like to, excuse me, uh, I'd like to ask Councillor Hegner to call the Finance Committee meeting to order and check to make sure that the non-voting members can hear and be heard. Um, I'm calling the, council, the uh, Finance Committee to order at 6.34. Um, Alicia, I, I notice uh, Councillor Walker has joined us. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you. And uh, Matt Holloway is present. Matt? Hey, Bob, can you hear me? Yes, Cam, thank you. All right, present. So uh, the, uh, the uh, Finance Committee is in order. <clears throat> thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting if you have technical um, issues. Oh. Yeah. Please let Athena and me know to make a comment or ask a question. Please use the raised hand button. If technical difficulties arise, we will deal with them at the time and determine if we have to suspend the meeting. Um, there will be a public comment during the public forum. And then during the regular council meeting, there will be an opportunity to comment on the item related to the public hearing, which is a poll. And in addition, there will be a general public comment period during the regular town council meeting that will follow this meeting on the same link. So I'm going to ask um, at this point, I'm just gonna just quickly mention without a big presentation, this is about the appropriation for a portion of town of Amherst capital program, new fire department pumper truck supplemental approach appropriation because of cost escalation. And just very quickly, on April 29, 2024, you have a memo from 
Paul Bachman on June 12th, 2023. The town council voted to appropriate $725,000 to fund the purchase of a new fire station, fire department pumper truck. The cost of the new fire department pumper truck has been quoted higher than the original quest, request and appropriation. This supplemental appropriation request will cover the difference. The new truck will be equipped with an idle mitigation system that will be funded through the sustainability department. At this point, given that this is a public forum, the floor is open. And let me note that we started the meeting at 6.32 and it is now 6.36. Are there any people who would like to make comment about the pumper truck? So we do have one name on the list. I don't know if it was for the pumper truck, but Vincent O'Connor has his name on the list. Thank you. Okay, I'm looking for any hands from the audience or any comments with regard to the pumper truck. Are there any comments with regard to the pumper truck? The public forum will remain open till 640 because we have to give equal time. Are there any comments with regard to the additional cost for the pumper truck? Pam, you have your hand up. It, we'll ask questions when we come to the council vote. Okay, it's 640. I'm just going to call on Bob Pegner. Uh, Bob, the Finance Committee met on this. Can you share with us their recommendation? Yes, at, at the Finance Committee met, met on May 3rd. It was a rather uh, slim committee at the time. It was early in our meeting. There were three Councilors present all voted yes, and one resident member voted to support. But we uh, recommended this pending the public hearing or forum. So uh, at this point, 
Does anyone who voted before wish to change their vote? Not seeing any, then the, then the Finance Committee does support this. Okay, given that, Bob, I'm not going to ask you to adjourn the Finance Committee. Okay, the Finance Committee is adjourned. Oh, no, I guess I have to call a motion. Motion to so adjourn. moved. Thank you. Second? I'll second. second. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will we'll vote on uh, adjourning the Finance Committee. Uh, I vote aye. Uh, Councilor Haneke? Aye. Uh, Kathy? Yes. Uh, Andy? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Matt Holloway? Support. We are adjourned at uh, 6 41 p.m. Okay, I'm going to move to adjourn the public forum and seek a second. Second. Thank you. I'm going to move immediately to a vote. Anna Devlin got here. Aye. Councilor Ette is still not here. Okay. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is aye. Councilor Haneke? Aye. Bob Hegner? Aye. Councilor Lord is absent. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Aye. The motion passes the the us. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. We're going to move right on to the um, regular town council meeting. Okay. Um, so again, it's still May 20th, but now we're into the regular town council meeting. I've already talked about the fact that we can meet under open meeting law and that the, this is accessible to the public in a various numbers of ways. So given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the May 20th, 24, 2024 regular town council meeting to order at 6.42. I'm going to take roll again. Um, and I'll start with Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna devlin Gotham. Present. Councillor Ette is going to punch that button and say present. Present. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Councillor Lord is absent. Pam Rooney. Here. Councillor Ryan. Still present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Proceed. Councillor Taub. I mean, I'm sorry, Jennifer Taub. Here. Councillor Walker. Here. Thank you. Okay. Um, During this meeting, there will be two public comment periods. One, the very first one is specific to the hearing. And um, the second one is the general public comment meeting. Um, I'm going to um, just call attention to a couple things under announcements. And that is that tomorrow night at 6.30 by Zoom, we have the required public hearing on the FY25 budget. On June 3rd at 6.30, we have a public forum on the capital improvement program and a regular town council meeting. Uh, the various meetings of councils are coming up. I do want to call attention to the fact that on Memorial Day, which is this coming Monday, a week from today, there will be a Memorial Day parade starting in downtown at nine o'clock and it will proceed to the War Memorial Pool with, where there will be a program. Um, with that, we're going to go on to the hearing. I believe there's somebody here, please come forward. Make sure the green light is on. And let me just say public hearings are an opportunity for residents to address the council on specific issues. The, these comments may be presented orally or in writing. While some public hearings may be required by Mass General Law, the town charter, or the council rules of procedure, the council may choose to hold a public hearing on any topic it chooses. The council may also designate a council committee to hold public hearings on its behalf. With that, I'm going to ask the petitioner to uh, speak to us about the petition. Hi, my name is Ryan Morich. I work for Eversource. Um, I'm here petitioning for a full uh, uh, 
Stanley Street, 173 Stanley Street, uh, requesting to add a joint own 45 uh, foot mid span pole. Um, this is uh, to provide room for a transformer um, for the customer at uh, 173 Stanley Street. They have a solar project and uh, they need to have a transformer close to their house to uh, be able to make that work. Would you please show the schematic on the screen? Can you enlarge it slightly, please? There's also a, should be a second picture. Yes. Also, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it on my screen. Uh, it's not showing on the council screens on our personal computers. It was. It was, and then it stopped. I saw it briefly, and then it dropped off. There it is. Okay. So there's three yellow X's. Could you please explain? Sure. So the the uh, the two on the outside are existing poles, and then the one X in the middle is where we would place the new mid-span pole. Um, if you scroll down to the, the second picture, it kind of shows it in real time. What does it look like? There'll be a pole right there uh, on the corner of uh, Tamarack Drive and Stanley Street. So it's that kind of tannish color pole. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Are there any questions from counselors? I do have one. This is in order for a individual home to put on solar? Yes. And do they have to pay anything for this additional pole? There is costs for this, yes. Uh, that's not anything that I can really speak to today. I don't control the costs of these or have an amount that this costs for you today. But is it, does the person requesting or requiring the additional poll? For it, it depends on uh, what has to be done to the system for that, for their solar to work. If they, if there's upgrades that are needed on Eversource's system, then there is a portion of that cost that the customer does have to pay us. Okay. Are there any other counselor questions? Then the public, the, the chair, the room is open to the public comment. I believe we had one person who wanted to speak. Please come forward. You can stay right where they are. They can use this mic. But I mean, please bring a chair up with you. <laughs> please state your name and where you live. Hi, my name's Jim Burset. I live on 180 Stanley Street, which is my house is right kind of where that pole is going to be. Um, and it's my neighbor across the street who already has solar installed and has had it installed since last year and needs this to happen in order to actually generate solar. So I, I support this and the location. Okay. Thank you for your comments and for being here. Are there any other public comments? There's one in the audience. <coughs> Pat on a Baku, please enter the room. This is public comment only with related to this poll. Hi, good evening. Can people hear me? Yes, we can, Pat. Yes, Pat on a from Tamarack Drive. Um, I did not know anything about this poll. And more than 95% of my neighbors did not know about this until yesterday at our annual meeting of Mr. Meadows. I think the town government should have sent information about this project to all aborters. As an aborter, I think it's disrespectful to have a project and not notifying neighbors. I'm not against it or am I in support of it, but it's just courtesy to send information to all aborters. So I did not know this was happening in my neighborhood and that's not right. Thank you. 
Um, I'm going to ask the town manager what he knows about notification to abutters. I believe the um, applicant provides cards to notify abutters, and I think Eversource can address that. Okay, thank you. We do. We uh, we send the cards out to anybody that's uh, that's an abutter in the area. And, and the definition of abutter in this case means adjoining property. Yes, uh, where the pole would go. Uh, there's a radius to that area, and we invite everybody in that area that would have, you know, if it's on their property or across the street from their property where the pole would go, we're not going to send them to people all the way down the road. Um, it would just be in the general area of where the pole is going. Okay. And I'm sorry, but um, for the town manager, that meets the requirement of notice? Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the public or comments? Pat, you still have your hand up. Did you have another comment? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, so what the Ephesus rep just stated is incorrect because um, my neighbor that is further away from the post uh, uh, project received a card on behalf of the entire neighborhood. I just want to put that out. It wasn't just the houses I just sent, but it was sent to one of the executive um, board member on behalf of, you know, the rest of the um, neighbors. Okay. In any case, I think I feel that all neighbors should have received this no notification. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, are there any additional public comments? Are there any questions from counselors? Jennifer. So I just want to ask, are, are Butters notices, I know if um, you know a, a project's going before the ZBA is within 300 feet, is that correct? I don't know exact rules for, ever, for the Eversource petitions, but it's, Usually a butters and a butters to a butters. I'm like, yeah, I guess what I'm wondering they is get the, the same number of feet. Uh, I'm not sure of a, a certain number of feet. I just know that it's the, you know, in the general area, you know, if it's on sure. in property, we've let him know. And then, you know, in if it's going to affect anybody in that area. Uh, I, I take a look at the properties. I don't go by footage. I wouldn't. If someone is in the back of this property, I wouldn't send them a notification that a pole is going to be here. It's just the general area is, is what we do. Uh, I'm unsure if there's an actual footage uh, to the location. So the planning board and the DBA do have actual footage. So maybe That's we could consider every source also, just so there's some consistency. Hmm. Andy? Yeah, standard question that I usually ask, uh, and that is, uh, is there any shade trees that will be affected by the installation of the pole? And if so, has the tree warden been consulted? Um, so no trees will be affected by this. Uh, whenever I do designing in Amherst, I make sure not to involve any trees or tree trimming. Okay. Lynn, if I may. The um, abutters notice application that Eversource always fills out, it does have a 300 foot. That's what oh. you check off when you when you apply for the abutters list. Okay, okay. good to know. Because the question was raised by one resident, whether or not everybody had been properly notified. That was before you came in to, back into the room. Eversource does send the notification cards to abutters. Um, or they send those to us. And then once we have the date of the hearing, we send them to the abutters according to the list that um, our assessor provides. So our list comes from the assessor. That's correct. And it's based on the number of feet away from the pole. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, were there any other questions from counselors? Okay. Then I'm going to um, um, take a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you. And um, 
Are there any other questions? Okay, then we're going to take a vote to close the hearing. And we're going to start with Councillor Ette. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Councillor Lord is absent. Um, Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Todd. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothia. Aye. It's unanimous to close the hearing. I, um, this item is on the consent agenda. I am going to remove it because the petitioner has asked that we vote so that he can leave. Okay. So with that, um, we are voting item. Thank you, 8A. Uh, the motion is to approve the order for joint or identical poll locations to install a one jointly owned 45 foot mid span pole at 173 Stanley Street, as indicated on the plan marked 1481416-8092365. Is there a second? Second. The motion's been made and second. Are there any further questions? Then we'll move to a vote. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord is absent. I keep forgetting. I'm sorry. Pam Rooney. Uh, yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. And Councillor Ette. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move to general public comment. Anyone wishing to speak who is in the town room, please make sure that you've signed up with the clerk of the town council. And if you are on Zoom, please raise your hand at this time. Athena, how many people have signed up? Four, thank you. And there's two on Zoom. Public comments are a matter within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. The First Amendment broadly protects individual rights to address the government, to speak and to express themselves, including their rights to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the First Amendment to the US Constitution unless their level of speech falls within an exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true, threat, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual or incitement of imminent lawless activity. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaged in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of freedom of speech. We'll recognize the speakers in the order in which they have signed up beginning with the room. Ben O'Connor. Vince O'Connor, 175 Summer Street. I comment on three documents. The first 
is a, and these are follow-ups on the Gaza resolution. The first is mainly and I received from the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee. Um, and what I would say regarding them is they are contacts have gone from thousands to hundreds of thousands because of what has been appearing on our televisions, radios, and so forth every day for the last seven months. I would urge the hundreds of people who signed the Gaza petition to in fact um, consider acting on the views they expressed in that petition by finding ways not to fund the activities that are going on in Gaza by contacting the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee. The second is a publication uh, entitled Free Thought Today from the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Throughout the world, we have a, a Buddhist uh, government in Myanmar pressing their Muslim minority. We have Christians in Africa who threaten gay and lesbian people with death because they are who they are. We have the tragedy in Palestine. And for the first time in our country's history, we have a presidential candidate who has issued a, has reprinted a religious text with his name on it for fundraising purposes. Um, my view is the Freedom From Religion Foundation is one of the premier groups, in addition to the ACLU, that has fought to keep this country from falling into the kind of religious uh, sectarian violence that occurs in many parts of the world. And I urge those who are concerned about such things and its financial consequences and political consequences for this, con for this country to contact the Freedom From Religion Foundation. The third document is the town manager's FY25 budget proposal, which in my opinion is disrespectful and insulting to the other three the residents of the other three towns in the region, the elected rep members of the regional school committee and the educators who staff the regional school committee. For someone who is not elected to act and present a budget that essentially Vince, your our time values is in the town are not the values sure. of education, I think is literally uh, an insult to everyone who engages in education. Vince, in this your group. time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken Rosenthal, please enter the room, state your name, and generally where you live. Thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue, and I'm going to make a comment tonight not about the library, which may surprise you. Instead, I'm going to make a, a, a repeated appeal that the town manager's office make it possible for all of us who attend by Zoom to know who we all are attending this meeting. This is not impractical. It's done in many places, and it facilitates, believe it or not, the efficiency of your meeting because it would make it possible for us to see other people who might be speaking on a subject, which would mean that we may not choose to speak, or we might choose to organize our comments so that they do not replicate somebody else's comments. The um, chair of the town planning board at the beginning of that board's meeting reads to the members of the board and the public the names of all the people who have uh, signed in so far on Zoom. But that just happens once, so that if you happen to be at the beginning of the meeting, you know who else might be at the meeting. You don't know during the meeting who might have left or who might have joined. And if you come in late, you will not have heard that at all. So I appeal again, please, uh, Mr. Manager, find a way to make it possible for all of us to know who we all are as we attend this meeting. Attendance by Zoom is as significant as attendance in person. Thank you for the time. Okay, back to the room. Maria Kopicki. Thank, 
Thank you, Maria Kapicki, South Amherst. Uh, earlier today, the Jones Library trustees met and voted to ask for an extension of six months to rebid this library project. They did this without one moment of discussion whatsoever about the cost of six more months of design and bidding or who would pay for that. There were three people in the audience that asked about that. They heard that before they voted. They did not act on that. They also had no idea about what their goal would be. The, the architects have already told us that they can't take $7 million off, but they had no idea about what they would be telling them to do. So I want to bring up a, a phrase that I learned back in my medical training, which is that if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. The library trustees spent a lot of time and their consultants trying to convince themselves that doing this again for another six months is going to end up with some kind of different result. You've got Fontaine Brothers, a reputable, experienced firm telling you it's gonna cost a lot more, which is not news to any of us. Uh, and nobody else wanted to touch it. So rather than saying, gee, I think maybe the problem here is that this project costs a lot more than we said, that would be the horses. They're twisting themselves into knots to try to find some way to explain this with zebras. I do wanna comment that the town council has still not had this topic on the agenda on its own so that members of the public could know what's going on and members of the council could address this specifically. It's been a month about, nearly at least, since the $47 million bid. You need to talk about this. You need to talk about the fact that the library is still $900,000 shy of its commitments at this point. There's a lot you guys need to talk about. Please put this on the agenda and talk honestly and rationally about where we really are. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um... Pat on a Baku, please enter the room, state your name, and generally where you live. You need to unmute, Pat. Oh, I'm sorry. There you oh, go. That's what it is. Can people hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Pat on a from Tamarack Drive. So I want to um express again my disappointment and frustration that uh happened in March when our town manager presented the upper funds most of you approved upper funds in 2021 including three hundred thousand dollars to white owned nightclub the Drake and this year, our Black organization, Black Business Association of Amherst, requested for funding and nothing. And you all did not say anything except for two Black women. I just want to call out this racism. We will continue to fight. We leave all options on the table, including litigation. Why on earth would town manager even recommend public restroom, bathroom, when black businesses are still struggling from the effects of COVID, which is what the fund is meant for? I also want to note that all BIPOC, -owned, uh, BIPOC organizations, including MS Media, community connections. These are led by black and brown women and they were not funded. And you all sat two months ago and did not say anything advocate. You were voted to represent the community. Is this the way you're doing your job? Please do your job. 
BBAA is still waiting for its own share of APA funds. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Back to the room. Amy Carlson. I'm Amy Carlson. Can you hear me? I live at 27 Kestrel Lane. I want to thank you for your time. You read, I am one of the original owners of property in the Meadows. My wife and I purchased the lot too in 2003. And with our then two-year-old son, we moved to Kestrel Lane in March 2004. We were the next to last home that Doug built, Doug Cole built in the Meadows. We love our home and our community. On any given day, our streets are full of families and friends walking in the quiet area that we have, the cul-de-sac, as well as using our community to access the rails trails, the numerous walking and hiking trails from several points in the Meadows. I'm here today in support of the council directing the town leadership to take the steps to accept the Meadows roads as described in Paul Bachman's recommendation that I believe you all have seen. Clearly the Meadows roads should have been accepted 20 years ago after construction on the last home was started in 2004. And the fact that a large sum of escrow dollars were returned to the builder at that time is clear evidence that the roads were largely ready to be approved. I don't wanna take you through these facts again. What I do wanna to highlight tonight is how the Meadows homeowners have approached this situation. When the Meadows began this last effort, and I, having been in the community for 20 years, have, I remember we had been talking about this since 2012 and contacting the people. Um, when the Meadows began this last effort three years ago, we were asked by the council to trust the process and work with the town and the builder to close the issue. As homeowners, we've been patient and steadfast. As an association, we have met frequently, we've debated, we've been frustrated and we've disagreed always to return to and support our road committee and the collaborative approach they and the town have advocated for. Lively debate has ended with unanimous votes to significantly share the pain of the situation that is not of our making. So today I'm asking that the town end this situation by accepting the town manager's recommendation. Let this difficult situation, the town manager's solution highlight how parties can compromise and achieve results when they choose negotiation over litigation. Thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you for your comments. Um, we have a comment on in Zoom, and this is the last one. Tony Cunningham, please enter the room, state your name and approximately where you live. Hi, uh, Tony Cunningham, North Amherst. Um, I was disappointed again to see that the Jones Library project status and its finances were not on your agenda for this evening. It's extremely time, time sensitive and it has extensive repercussions on our town's budget and on future spending. I noticed you had a public forum on the supplemental appropriation for the fire truck for $126,000 or something in that range. How come there hasn't been an, a public forum on the library going above and beyond the 1.8 million in spending that was in the memorandum of agreement? And how come there isn't a forum to keep going with this project, knowing that it's going to continue to cost more money? Uh, lastly, I'd like the council to be very clear where the 2.9 million is coming from to pay back the MBLC when this project inevitably ends. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, back to the room. James Master Alexis. James Master Alexis, 35 Linden Ridge Road. Good evening, members of the town council and the town council president. To um, paraphrase uh, the Beatles, it has been a long and winding road that leads us here to your door, which is also probably a bad pun. But um, I wanted to uh, come to before you today to let you know that I'm here with three of my neighbors that are sitting back there with me. 
and I believe there's uh, others in the neighborhood watching on Zoom. Um, my wife and I and our three children moved into the neighborhood in 2005, and we were the only people that lived in the neighborhood. Since then, we've seen one house. There was one, we were there for a year until another family moved in. We've seen 50 plus houses built in the neighborhood, and I've seen with my own eyes every stage of the road in this neighborhood that had that was built. I'm happy to, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to rehash all this history, but I'm I'm happy to uh, review the packet. I was happy to review your packet and read it throughout the last couple of months to see that the planning board and the unanimous vote, the town engineer, and I believe the town manager as well in his memo have recommended to you, excuse me, that you accept the roads in Amherst Hills as public ways because they are built to the town specifications according to the town engineer. Um, we've been through a lot, we've been through litigation, we've been through meetings at the planning board, all those things are resolved. And the ultimate answer here is the roads are in proper shape. So I would ask that you accept our roads because to let you know this issue started in, for me in 2019, the first memo I wrote to Christine Bradster was in October, I believe of 2019. So we obviously are in 2024. So I would ask you for a positive vote this evening. Um, and I want to thank you for your time. And I also want to thank the town engineer, who I don't know personally, but I see him driving back and forth in his yellow truck in my neighborhood. I want to thank him for that. I want to thank Mr. Mooring. Uh, I want to thank the town manager for his transparency and his, will his willingness to meet with myself and members of our neighborhood twice when we asked him, we worked around his schedule and we were we talked to him about what was going on here. I want to thank him um, and you, Madam President. You run a really nice meeting here. Um, <laughs> we're reading all the things you have to read. Thank you very much. And as with my last thirty seconds, I want to give you an aside. In 1987, I was involved in town government, Watertown, Massachusetts, and we bought a pumper truck. And that <laughs> pumper truck was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in 1987. So very expensive. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And please vote yes on the roads in the Amherst Hills. Thank you for your comment. Uh, there is one more hand on Zoom that I'm going to allow. Kath Cathal Kearney, please enter the room, state your name and approximately where you live. Um, pardon me, if there are others in the room who'd like to make a public comment, the sign-in sheet is right over here. Hello. Hold, hold on one, please. Hold on one second. If you came, there's a couple of you that came in later. We're in the public comment. If you want to make public comment, you need to sign up over with the clerk of the town council. Okay. Um, Cathal Kearney, go ahead, please. Great. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Councillor Chairperson. Uh, my name is Cahill Kearney. I live in 16 Kestrel Lane, and I just want to uh, speak in support of the public way acceptance request for the Meadows and Amherst Fields. Um, I think one of my neighbors, Amy, kind of eloquently summarized my feelings on this, but I would just like to add uh, one or two small points. I guess the main one is where we moved into the town uh, in 2000 or 2020, rather, and um, we have three small children and we haven't been able to move forward with fixing the roads. We've tried every possible avenue and I'm very grateful that the town manager has recommended that the the roads be accepted as is so that we can finally just move forward with creating a safe set of roads for our kids where you know we're all taxpayers to the town um, and we're very grateful that the town continues to plow the roads but we're sort of caught in a limbo now and i would just uh, urge you all to support uh, the town manager in this and support uh, this motion thank you thank you for joining us uh athena connie kruger Very briefly about Amherst Hills is some- Please state your name and oh, approximately where you live. Connie Kruger, 15 Hopkirk Road, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say along with some of my neighbors and I think um, our whole group that we do support the Amherst Hills request for their roads. Their roads have been finished and passed muster with town engineer. But there is one issue I wanted to bring up. And I also wanna speak again when we get to Hopkirk and Kestrel. So this is really about Amherst Hills unless you punch them all together and missed the very beginning. But there is one 
asset that Tofino still has that is worth a lot of money to them. And those are the unreleased lots in Amherst Hills. And separate from accepting the road, and it's a planning board issue whether the planning board will release those lots for construction. And I might ask that, or I am asking, that the town council consider writing a letter to the planning board recommending to them that they do not release any more lots in Amherst Hills to Tofino until such time as all other issues with the town, such as Upbrook and Kestrel, and there may be others, are settled to the satisfaction of the town manager. So I just wanted to make that point. And um, when it's appropriate, I'd like to speak very briefly about how Hopbrook and Kestrel. Um, I think we're going to go ahead with the public comments for Hopbrook and Kestrel now. So should I just keep going? Yep. You gotta so be you've learned a lot about our road. You probably are about as tired of hearing about Hopbrook and Kestrel as I am. Um, and uh, what I wanted to say was that in speaking, um, I've been asked to speak on behalf of our association. We're a little bit in limbo. We had an annual meeting on April 28th, which is being continued. Our president, Doug Dunnell, is in Colorado right now. He is stepping down. I am stepping down from the road committee, but we haven't reappointed anyone, so we're kind of in an in-between place. And rather than reiterate all of the history, I just want to say that we support the manager's recommendation. It's in line with proposals we've made to the council and feel really good about the possible resolve finally as expressed in that memo. I wanted to just say for me, um, I really respect uh, our town manager and in many conversations we've had about this road issue that's been going on for about 20 years, not Paul hasn't been here that long, but at one point, uh, Mr. Balkerman said, Connie, why are you, why do you care so much about your road? What's going on? And the reason that I've worked so hard on this issue is because I think the town made a mistake and didn't protect the residents. Towns make mistakes. It doesn't mean there's a legal liability necessarily, but I'd like to see this remedy for the protection of the neighborhood. And I think this is a chance to remedy something that didn't work out in the past. Thank you. Um, again, Athena, any other comments? Ned Diebold. Hi, Ned Diebold, uh, resident of 27 Hopbrook Road, and former president of the Homeowners Association and the current member of the Urban Committee. Um, I won't reiterate everything that's been outlined, but I. Want to do? I do want to offer my support for uh, what um, the town manager has recommended, and that, um, as Connie said, you have a chance to fix a problem that's twenty years old. Everything that has need to be aired about this has been aired in the last twenty years. Some some revelations new, but um, as you can see in in um, Buckman's letter, this is a problem that's manageable right now. If we wait and you table it longer, it becomes a larger problem. So you have the power to fix it when it's manageable. That's, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other people? No, that's all. Okay. That concludes public comment for this evening. Uh, we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Um, and let me just say, I have already been notified that a at least one item will be removed. So I'm going to just remind you that to remove an item does not require a second. So I'm going to uh, read the original consent agenda. I think it would be best if we could post it on the screen and notice that I've already removed one item as well. Uh, I'm reading it and then we'll go to see whether people want to remove something. Um, to move the following items in the print and motions thereunder and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of Memorial Day proclamation. 6B, proclamation recognizing June as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer plus, LGBTQ plus Pride Month. 6C, race amity day proclamation. 6D, commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the South Congregational Church Amherst United Church of Christ. We have eliminated 8A 
8B, adoption of council order FY24 05D, and order appropriating funds for a portion of the Town of Amherst Capital Program, new fire department pumper truck supplemental appropriation to cover cost escalation. 8C1, approval of use of public way, mobile market on East Hadley Road, signs at Groff Park, Mill Lane, and Belchertown Road. 8C2, approval of use of public way, farm stand at 822 East Pleasant Street. 8H, referral of proposed FY25 water and sewer rates to finance committee. 11A, approval of the February 5, 2024, regular town council meeting minutes. Um, Mandy Jo. Um, I want to remove item 8C2, the use of the public way related to the farm stand at 822 East Pleasant Street. Okay. Are there any other requests for removal? Remembering that when we actually get to that item, if you have a question, which I know, Pam, you did at one point, you can ask that question. Okay. Um, are there any other um, removals? So the we've removed two from this, and that's 8A and 8C2. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, we're moving to a vote. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Oh, I will second it if there wasn't a sign to the sorry. consent Thank motion, you. and then I will also vote aye. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go back and vote aye now that it's been seconded. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lord. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. It is unanimous with 12 councilors present and one absent. Um, we are going to uh, briefly pause to do a little bit of reading regarding the resolutions. And the first one is the Memorial Day Proclamation, Councillor Ette. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, hereby proclaim May 27th, 2024, to be Memorial Day and urge all residents of Amherst to recognize the sacrifice of past residents and observe this day in remembrance of them. Thank you. Um, Anna, 7B, proclamation regarding LGBTQ+. I wanna start a little bit before the now therefore is because they're pretty cut and dry. Um, Whereas Amherst recognizes the important contributions of its LGBTQ plus residents to the town's history, culture, economy, and civic life, and whereas we affirm our support for our LGBTQ residents, including our youth, and stand with them to protect their civil rights and ability to live openly without fear. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, do hereby proclaim June 2024 as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Be it further proclaimed that we, the Amherst Town Council, encourage all residents to celebrate and affirm our proud and diverse LGBTQ plus community year round. Be it further proclaimed, this proclamation will be recognized by raising the Progress Pride flag from June 1st to June 30th, 2024, with a formal flag raising celebration and proclamation reading on June 13th at 3 o'clock p.m. to coincide with the Amherst celebration of queer identity and progress. Thank you. Um, Race Amity Day Proclamation, Pat. Now, therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, hereby proclaim Sunday, June 9th, 2024, to be Race Amity Day, a celebration of the oneness of the human family, and ask the community to join in a joint celebration with the Human Rights Commission at Mill River Recreation Area on June 9th, 2024, for a picnic at noon followed by the program for Race Amity Day and Youth Hero Awards um, in the uh, following period. And in commemoration of the 200th anniversary of the South Congregational Church, Amherst United Church of Christ, now therefore be it resolved we, the Amherst Town Council, 
do hereby commemorate the 200th anniversary of the 2024 as um, South Congregational Church Amherst and Amherst's 200th anniversary celebration year. Thank the members and friends of the South Congregational Church Amherst for their many contributions to the community and urge other residents to celebrate this milestone in the history of the South Congregational Church Amherst and our town. We have no presentations or discussion tonight. We're going to move on to action items. We have already dealt with 9A and we have dealt with 9B and we have dealt with 9C and we are going to move on to 9D, which is Amherst Hills. We heard this uh, report at the last- C2. I'm sorry, you're right. I'm sorry, 8C2. We are going to 8C2. Farm stand at 822 East Pleasant Street. I'm going to place the motion on the table. As soon as I find it, yeah. To approve the placement of a wooden farm stand 500, I mean, five feet wide by 12 feet long with shingled roof and solar panel and wooden sign in the town way at 822 East Pleasant Street. Is there a second? Second, Dublin got there. Okay, uh, Mandy Joe, you asked that this be pulled. Please speak to your request. So I pulled it because uh, the motion is worded. I'm not sure is appropriate, but I'm also not sure it's needed. Um, the motion is worded grants this use of the public way permanently. Um, it doesn't indicate how big the sign can be or not be. It doesn't really say where it is. Um, but the map provided to us in the motion packet is my bigger concern because that map doesn't even indicate that the farm stand is on the public way, nor is the parking area on the public way. And maybe the sign is not even on the public way. And so I'm not even sure we need to grant this because I don't have enough information to determine that what the requester is requesting is actually something within the public way. Um, I also have concerns um, if it's not in the public way, my guess is it needs to go to the planning board or ZBA. I don't know um, if it's in the public way, maybe it doesn't, maybe it just comes to us. Um, but there's been prior talk of putting a sidewalk on East Pleasant Street. There's been studies done. In fact, JCPC funded a study a couple of years ago about a sidewalk there. I don't know what side of the street that sidewalk might go at 822 North Ple East Pleasant Street to know whether the farm stand here, if it actually goes in the public way, would be problematic with potential future plans for a sidewalk. Um, and so without answers to any of those questions, including knowing whether we're even granting something for use of the public way versus where the map shows it is, which is not in the public way, um, at this point, I can't vote for a motion. Okay. Um, I'm gonna see, uh ask the town manager to speak to this. And Anna, you had a question before that. Well, it's kind of in line with what Mandy said, but if it's not in the public way, great, they can rock on. It's also very small. And so it might be small enough that it's below the need for um, permitting by those boards and they could just do this on their own. Um, so I think, I mean, based on, I hope I'm not getting myself in trouble. Like I was able to build a shed that was small enough that I didn't need permitting. And this is smaller than the shed I built. So I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, if this isn't in the public way, they can just do it. Um, I'm not concerned about the sidewalk issue, partly because based on this building, they could forklift it out of the way. Um, but I think that our number one question is, is this in the public way? And that- Let me pause and then the how manager to speak to this. So it wouldn't be before if it weren't in the public way. So that's why it's before you. The uh, prop, the owner uh, of the um, of the farm stand asked to be able to put this um, shelter. Uh, it's really not in. It's, it can't be. You can't stand in it. Was and it's on wheels. But in the public way, the public way in that section of East Pleasant Street is very very wide, um, and so he went to put it closer to the road. Uh, he was going through inspection services. They said, "Well, where you want to put it is in the public way. You need to get permission from." the town council to put something in the public way. 
um, then he would go back and get the permits that he, if you say yes, then he would go back to the, um, to get the permits you'd need, probably most likely for the sign is the most likely thing he would need a, a permit from the planning board for. Um, given given that, I think that the, the point is, um, we had talked about giving them a license um, to, to which is a <clears throat> revocable permission. So if anything in the future did come up that we needed the space, we would just revoke the license. Um, it would be for a dollar a year or something like that. So there's no charge. This is the type of activity we're trying to encourage in town and, and it's a, a addition to the town. Um, and um, again, it's a relatively small structure. It's on wheels. Uh, and I, I think it's fair if the council would like to put a time frame on it, either a year or renewable on a regular basis or on a revocable basis, things like that. That's perfectly uh, realistic. Uh, Kathy. Um with something like this, were any of the neighbors asked about what they think about the farm stand? You know, and Paul, you said it's a really extensive public way. I've been struck with when I asked once about public way along the street I live in, uh, the answer from the planning board director is you have to give me an address because it varies for every address along the road. So Mandy probably looked at this and said, you know, are we talking about five feet, 20 feet, 30 feet? Um, so it, it, I just have a quite, that's my question because for three or four months, people may be delighted with this, but do we need to ask? I do not believe a uh, notification was given to the two neighbors. Okay. Andy. Yeah. I, my question about this when I was reading it is, uh, what is the zoning in the area and, uh, is this consistent with the zoning? Yeah, is there anything that would require uh, CBA action? And I was missing that information. Uh, when I talked to the building commissioner, he did not indicate there were zoning issues. But again, the 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 threshold question was: Does the council want this on its land or not? And if you say yes, then they would go through the permitting process. Mandy Joe. So I'm still confused. I I understand everything you said that inspections and planning said it's in the public way, but the chart we got, the plan we got, doesn't have it in the public way on page two that Athena put up. Unless I'm reading this wrong, it it's not in the public way. That pink box, all of that is on private land unless I'm reading it wrong. Um, and so if that's not where it's going, we don't have the right chart or plan that tells us where it would go on this parcel or in the public way adjacent to this parcel. And so I, I cannot vote until we have an appropriate plan for the use of the public way, because what we were given doesn't show use of the public way. So we can take it back and, and have them review it, and get a clearer map for you, if you'd like. Can I ask one other question? Is the parking area in the public way? Is uh, that gonna be moved to the public way? I mean, that, that's another part of the right, question. Right. Yeah, I think that's something the building commissioner had also identified as something that would need to be addressed to the, to the permitting agencies. So it sounds as if there's some unresolved questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, um, so given that there's some unresolved questions, I'm going to withdraw the motion and um, bring it back for a future agenda, okay? All right, uh, we're now on to acceptance of public way Amherst Hills. Mandy Joe, you still have your hand up. Was that a, okay, thank you. Um, this was discussed uh, at length and all of the material was available last time. We, it, the thing that we were lacking was the motion. I'm going to make the motion and seek a second. Having determined that 
common convenience and necessity require the acceptance of Hawthorne Road, Linden Ridge Road in Perens portion and Concord Way as town ways to lay out Hawthorne Road, Hawthorne Road, Linden Ridge Road in Perens portion and Concord Way as public ways which layouts are shown more particularly on a plan entitled Plan of Land of Amherst and Belchertown, Massachusetts, surveyed for Tofino Associates, Inc., dated June 29th, 2020, 2004, and recorded with the Hampshire County Register of Deeds at Plan Book 201, pages 43 to 48, which plan was referred to the planning board and which plan is hereby adopted as part of this order and all land lying within the layouts of Hawthorne Road, Linden Ridge Road portion and Concord Way are laid out as public ways and here, there and further, the town hereby accepts from Tobino Associates Incorporated deeds conveyed said public ways to the town and easements related thereto. Is there a second? Second, Devlin got there. Okay. The floor is open for discussion. Are there any questions or comments? I do have one. Does this include the unsold lots? I would recognize uh, either Superintendent Mooring or Planning Director Brustrup on this item. Chris, please go ahead and unmute. So when you are accepting a public way, you are only accepting the public way. You're not accepting any lots. The lots are separate and are owned privately and will be sold privately. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments? Gilford has said. Gilford, please go ahead. So if you actually look at the description, can you hear me? Yes. Now I we froze. can, yes. I froze, sorry. If you look at the description of what you're accepting, you're not accepting the public, the road in front of the lots in question. That's the uh, that's the item called portion. Yes. Thank you very much. I wanted to make sure we clarify that for the public. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, quickly, Lynn, I just want a clarification. I understand now that the lots are not um, being uh, part of this, but can we? Um, limit the developer's ability to build on them can we hold them or is there because i think that we should but i think it's a chris question chris i think you could make a recommendation to the planning board that you recommend that um, the planning board hold those lots um, and not release them um, but i don't believe that the town council has the jurisdiction to retain those lots. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the motion we're voting on is the motion of the acceptance of these roads with Linden Ridge Road being a portion of that road, thus accommodating for those lots. Are there any other questions from the council? Then we're moving to a vote. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Lord is absent. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Todd. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Rette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It is unanimous with 12 councilors present and one absent. Is there any? Yes. Jennifer. I want to pick up on what Pat uh, asked, hmm. that if we wanted to send a letter to the planning board in relation to the Meadows and Hawkwood to not release additional lots until that was satisfied, would we do that now or put it on the agenda for a future meeting? Um, it probably would be cleaner to put it on the agenda for a future meeting. So if you want to request that when we get to future agenda items, let's make sure that happens, okay? Mandy Joe? I believe someone would have to draft a letter and propose it as a measure for the council. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay. Um, under the Meadows, there is a motion. I'm going to read it and seek a second. There, to request the town manager move forward with the layout and acceptance of the subdivision roadways that were built as part of the Meadows subdivision, specifically Kestrel Lane and Hopbrook, for acceptance by the town as public ways in their current condition after specific actions are taken as enumerated in the memo to the town council titled public way acceptance request the Meadows at Amherst Fields, dated May 16th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. The floor is open for discussion. Questions, comments? Paul, would you like to speak to this? Um, sure. So um, you have heard a lot about the Meadows, the, the roads in the Meadows, and, and seeking to have them accepted as public ways. This has been before you for, for a couple of years now. And before that, about 20 years before, it was um, deemed to be um, ready enough to be accepted that the planning board released about $100,000 worth of funds that it held in escrow um, to meet because the work had been substantially completed. So in that intervening time, for lots of reasons that, um, you know, including the death of the developer and a number of things that happened, these roads were never accepted by the town. So, so what has happened in the meantime, this is a wet area, and the roads have deteriorated. The conundrum for the town has been that typically when we accept a public way, we want them to be in condition as if they were freshly paved in essence, that they, they're in good shape, that we're not taking on additional liability. And that's been the town's policy that, that the private owner of the roads bring them up to standards um, prior to the town accepting them. The concern the town engineer had has, and has is that we will be accepting a road that needs substantial investment of funds when the town already, as you all know, has a substantial backlog of needs for road repairs. So that's been the conundrum and the property owners who live in the area are, are very frustrated because they continue to pay property taxes and feel that um, you know these roads should have been accepted many years ago by the town the town's uh, perspective is um, these roads are not up to speed for uh, how we should be accepting them. So the, the challenge that the um, town council presented was, can you figure a way out and meet the needs of the town and the property owners? Um, we, we attempted that earlier this year, ran into some, and the answer to all these questions is about money. Who's gonna put money on the table to bring the roads up to decent condition? Um, I ran in, we ran to a, um, uh, an, an, uh, the developer felt like they had done what they had to do and were willing to do what they were required to do, but were not interested in bringing and in, making further investments into the roads other than the um, money that we already had, um, in hand for that. Um, I've had additional conversations with the developer. They're, they're more open to having some part of that conversation. My understanding is the Homeowners Association is willing to stand by its uh, commitment of $140,000. We would assemble the funds that we need, the, we can, that we put together to do the work, the basic bare minimum work that needs to be done, mainly catch basins being repaired so people don't get hurt or vehicles don't get damaged. The road will not be brought up into, um, into the level that we would like it to be. But I think that um, we will we will integrate it into our overall pavement management plan, and it will the property owners should know that it's not a high priority because we have so many roads that are in worse shape than um, Hop Brook and Kestrel Lane. So that's sort of the way you know to move forward. We take take some funds from the property owners, the developer, and the town to get the basics done. Um, put it on the list of things that need to be done down the road, have it be accepted, which uh, as a public way, and then um, we start to move forward. The town has continued to plow the road uh, with the understanding that was built to subdivision standards um, at the time. And, but the caution has been that the road continues to deteriorate. And you know, at some point, if the roads aren't, the basic things aren't improved, that um, it might start to damage our plow. So those things have to be done for us to be able to continue to plow the road. So the other thing I want to mention is that there are, and I gave you a list of all the private roads um, in the town, plus all the private roads that were built to subdivision standards. 
Um, one of the concerns I have had and staff has had is that this may set a precedent for other roads that you seek to accept. Um, and, um, and so you see that in your, um, in the in the packet of information so you're well aware of what is coming down the road there are there's a handful of roads that um were built to subdivision standards and the property owners there may come in seeking acceptance of those roads as well but i think one of my, my logics on this is because the property owners and developer are putting money into bringing the roads up to a, sta a decent standard um that that was that's also setting a precedent for contributions from property owners I'm not sure if Guilford or Chris have anything to add to that. I'm just not seeing their hands. Okay. Um, Bob Hegner? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, commend uh, <clears throat> the town manager for coming up with this compromise. It seems reasonable to me. I think we need to uh, we need to get these the, the poor residents of Kestrel and Hopbrook out of the, the limbo they've been in um, for, you know, 20 years plus. I mean, I almost bought a house on, on Kestrel myself. So I might have been in that that uh, that group, uh, you know, petitioning you. Uh, fortunately, I, I chose differently. Uh, but um, I do think that, um, you know, it, this is a unique situation. I think, um, you know, we, I don't know that it sets a precedent. I think that we deliberated on this and, you know, Paul, you deliberated on this. You, you worked with the, the developer, you worked with the homeowners. I think we came up with the right solution for this particular problem. And uh, let's, you know, I, I, I think it's time for us to just get this off the plate and get these, these poor people out of limbo. <clears throat> Thank you. Andy. Yes, um, I'll adopt everything that Bob just said and just add a couple things there. One is appreciation to people who have lived on Kestrel Lane and Opera for um, their perseverance and their willingness to be cooperative and uh, the work that they have done to reach a uh, resolution to this. Also, I want to uh, recognize that for a reason that has never been identified and need not be identified, a mistake was made in the release of lots for construction without money being added to the trust fund that was established for the repair of the roads. And uh, that meant that there was uh, funds that were not available uh, that might have been available and uh, you know, it, 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 we can't go back now and um, redo history, but we can recognize that that happened. And the last thing that uh, point out, I think that town managers uh, has alluded to it already, but to recognize that um, all of us who have uh, lived in roads that have been accepted long ago, uh, the, we've been paying taxes and uh, we've been in line um, for road repair as is necessary in the logical order established uh, by due processes that have been here. And uh, our residents on the two roads, Hopbrook and Kestrel, have also been paying taxes. And this just places them, after many years of paying taxes, this is not a new thing. Um, being in the position that the rest of us are in. So I'll let that go and thank you. Uh, Councilor Ryan. So Paul, in the, in the motion we have before us, you have listed a set of conditions that need to be met in order for us to move to a final vote on November 1st. And I'm just wondering how confident or optimistic you are that all these conditions will be met. I note that one of them involves a, a sizable amount of money um, and so I guess my question is, do you feel that you're pretty optimistic that these calls can be met? And if some or more of them are not met, where would that leave us on November 1st? Um, so first I wanna recognize the Homeowners Association and their willingness to come to the table and have the conversation and be in a problem solving mode. And they've been very um, uh, 
helpful in thinking through this process. Um, you know, I think the um, representative of the of the owner of the roads, the developer, is willing to have additional conversations, um, and uh, was pretty intent on making sure that Amherst Hills roads were accepted, so we can have that further conversations. I I have trust that that those con conversations will be productive. Um, I've given you know I think there's the money for the homeowners association is coming out from property owners. They have to write checks. And so not everybody's going to have easy access to money to do that. So we're at, it's a big request from the property owners. And I appreciate that. We want to give them ample time to be able to meet that goal. Um, and, and as well as the, um, the developer. So I'm optimistic that we can get the, to the number um, and all the other conditions I think we can certainly get to. Um, I'd like to ask, based on the question that was asked regarding Amherst Hills, are there any lots that Tofino still owns in this subdivision? Professor Gilford. No, there's no buildable property left in the subdivision. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Motion's been made and seconded. We'll move to a vote. We'll start with uh, Bob Hagner. Aye. Councilor Lord is absent. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Ka Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councilor Walker? Yes. Patty Angelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Councilor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Hannock? Aye. It's unanimous with one absent. Uh, I am going to actually take up AG 8G, and if there are any questions on 8H, uh, so that Wilfred Mooring doesn't have to stay with us for the rest of the evening. Um, 8G is acquisition of gauge property on Sand Hill Road for water supply protection and appropriation order. The motion is as follows, and I seek a second, to refer the proposed acquisition of the gauge property on Sand Hill Road in Shutesbury for water supply protection and appropriation order to the Finance Committee with a report and recommendation to the Town Council by June 17th, 2024. Is there a second? Ryan, second. Thank you. Are there any questions? Mandy Jo. I'm sorry, Councillor Haneke. So I was struck by the amount of land we own in this watershed. Um, and so I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, what is the goal of ownership in this watershed? Uh, is the town of Amherst aiming to buy nearly every parcel of land it can if it drains into the Atkins Reservoir? Um, how much does ownership of land with for water protection cost the town a year? That that question relates to property taxes we have to pay to other towns, um, any maintenance, any inspections, anything we have to do in this land. Um, what is it beyond the cost of the purchase of the land that we incur on an annual basis to purchase all of this? Um, and it sounds like the next one is sort of, you know, the memo indicated that this land has the potential to have one house being built on it. Um, and so does that in some sense mean we're buying this land to, pre to prevent some, just one piece of one housing unit to be built? Is there no other concern beyond just a one unit house or one dwelling unit, one house being built on this property as to why we need to protect this? Um, so those are my questions. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Mooring, please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you for moving it up. I appreciate that. Um, so yes, um, we are required to put protections in our watershed by DEP to de restrict development and to protect the water sources. So we don't need all the land in the watershed. We predominantly need to own the zone A, which is the land which is adjacent to streams and most of the wetlands in the area. So if it's a, a buildable lot that's not next to a stream, 
that doesn't need to be protected as much as a buildable lot that's next to a stream. So having a house on a septic system with possible oil heat or propane um, next to the uh, stream that feeds directly into the watershed is a risk. And DEP wants us to pursue protecting those properties so that they we protect the watershed. And sort of a belt and suspenders, this is like the super suspenders to keep uh, everything safe and protected. Um, the family who owns this property came forward and offered the property for protection, and they didn't want to see a house built on it either. So it meets both the town's watershed goals and the property owner's goals. Um, we pay about $53,000 a year to the town of Pelham and property taxes. So this piece of property will be added to our tax, our taxable property in Pelham, and we'll pay a little more in property taxes. Um, we are the, the watershed department, uh, water department is actually the third largest property owner in the town of Pelham. The first being, I think, Coles Lumber, the second being the state, and then the town of Amherst is the next. Um, so we we do pursue certain pieces of property that are in those special zone A's to uh, try to protect them and keep them, keep the watershed protected. Are there further questions? Okay. Uh, could you please explain how we are going to be paying for our portion of this land? The money will come out of the um, undesignated fund balance for the water enterprise system. Um, we will pay the the state will pay sixty thousand sixty eight thousand dollars, and then we'll pay the remainder, um, the forty thousand dollars out of our mm -hmm. reserves. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I just have a question, uh, Guilford, about the the taxes. Uh, what fund or what pot of money does that come out of? The taxes to Palm? Taxes for the the water enterprise system comes from the enterprise system. As part of the rates, it's built into the rates that we have to pay these taxes. Um, we run as a, we try to run as a business. And so everything is covered in that rate. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, are there any further questions? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. And in this case, I'm starting with Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Patty Angelos. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Councilor Rette. Aye. Lynn Griesmerson. Aye. Mandy. Councilor Hannigan. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. And um, Councilor Lord is absent. It is unanimous. 12 in favor and one absent. Uh, I'm going to ask the council at this point, since we voted, uh, referral of the water and sewer rates to the finance committee. Are there any questions while we have Superintendent Maureen here about the proposed FY25 water and sewer rates? Bob Hegner? When do you need uh, a decision on or a recommendation from the finance committee? June 17th. June 17th. Okay, thank you. In time, in time for that meeting. Right. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Uh, Guilford, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest we take, I'm sorry to do this to you, Doug, but we're going to take a 10 minute break and we'll be back at 8.15. Please unmute and turn your video on when you come back, turn your video back. Please, Please mute. We don't need no, we don't just stop. No, don't don't touch. <laughs> So, do you think you guys can sit on the bar at the end of the meeting? Yeah, I was going to say, guys, I don't know. That's where I'm going to sit. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Thank you for joining us, Myra. We're just taking a short break and then we'll um, we have one other agenda item before we move on to the Commission on Disability. So you're welcome to turn your camera off and hang on just until we get to your item. So the, the question though is, it all depends on how much full assessment there is. Because so, but I'm not sure that's really not the best two questions. So both. Oh. I don't know what we can and if there's more than one to that or if it's all huh? Thank you. 
I'm getting there yet. Looking forward to the next day to go back to your job. Nice. Yeah, just a few less things to keep track of. Lynn, is it all right that I'm here? Lynn, is it all right that I'm here? Is that what you expect? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to have you make the presentation and not deal with motions until after your turn. As you return, put your videos on, please. All right, as you return, please turn your video back on. Councilor Walker, are you back with us? Yes, I am. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much. Um, as we go into the discussion of the track, I'm not going to put a motion on the table to begin with. Instead, I'm going to ask interim superintendent uh, Slaughter to uh, describe to us what has been refer what has been requested of us by the school committee, and then we'll do go through the various motions. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. And welcome. Thank you. Um, so the school committee met on the uh, on the 30th of April and then again on the 14th of May and and 
in those two different meetings, we talked about the track project. And so in the first meeting, we would gotten a, our, our first update of some of the uh, uh, estimates for, for various um, renditions of potential projects. Uh, I believe there were 11 that evening. Uh, as a result of the conversation, we ended up with the 12th one that we asked our, our designers to, to run the numbers for. Uh, these aren't in depth, they're more conceptual in nature. And so we were uh, able to sort of make that request without it being too, too onerous on our on our designer. But nonetheless, uh, they gave us an additional number. And, and part of the reason for that uh, ask for an additional design was was because the funding we had available in in uh, sort of cash in hand, for lack of a term, um, was uh, able to meet one of the projects that were in the list of eleven. But then there was uh, a sort of in you know, and uh, there are an additional chunk of of funds available that that we might potentially be able to tap into if if the uh, town council took some action. Uh, and so we wanted to look at an option that fit with that amount of funding. So uh, we asked them to do that, that additional design. So what we knew in, in that meeting on the, on the 30th of April is we had uh, a little over $1.7 million worth of available resource. And that uh, allows us to do a project which is labeled 1B in the list from our designer SLR. Uh, and what that 1B option does is to replace the track where it sits, add additional lanes to that, uh, and do a very modest uh, reconditioning or, or renovation of the of the uh, of the grass field interior to that. Uh, it doesn't re uh, do the drainage. It doesn't redo the uh, 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 irrigation. Uh, it's a much more modest sort of approach. However, there are two different appropriations already in place uh, from from uh, CPA, uh, as well as a free cash appropriation that the council did, uh, that both had some level of restriction on them. And so uh, I thought it appropriate to sort of ask the school committee to make direct request of you guys uh, to potentially uh, reduce those, those um, restrictions in order to have more funding available for a more expansive project. And that's where uh, the second uh, option that's available to us, which is labeled 1D or named 1D, uh, which again keeps the keeps the track in in its current location. It does expand it to eight lanes, like the like the one B, but it does a much more extensive uh, field reconstruction, um, and and so it's a much more robust change to the to the to the interior field surface. Um, it also addresses a a lighting uh, change that's necessary, and that comes in at. Um, and I'll change my glasses on here. Um, a little under three point four million dollars, three point three six was the estimate, which is which is less than the total of the uh, one point seven seven three eight four zero plus one point seven million that that are available. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it, it's within that budget. Um, and so, in thinking about this and 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 thinking about what the restrictions were on those. Uh, original appropriations that we're asking for a change to, both of them involved a north-south orientation. And if we think back and reflect back onto the master planning process that we as a regional school district and the, and the town of Amherst went through several years ago, one of the key pieces of the first phase was to reorient the field. And that's a, it's a much superior field orientation uh, for play, much safer and, and, a, and a better all overall orientation for the, for the purpose of of utilizing uh, the space we have more efficiently, uh, so there was an option already in existence uh, in the in in the uh, presentation from the 30th of April that our designer gave us. Uh, we did go back and ask him to 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 uh, refine the numbers a little bit after looking at at some more data that they had, uh, and so that original estimate, which was 4.8, was was knocked down uh, to 4.23 million. Um, and that's option 3C. Now, 3C and 1B existed back on April 30th when we first talked to our designer. 1D, some Doug, um, it was an additional sort of review, and it really had to do with, with uh, a very similar thing to 1B, but with a more enhanced uh, renovation uh, and reconstruction of the, of the field interior to the, to, the, uh, to the track as it exists now. Um, so those are sort of three options, and, and part of the, the idea with, with bringing this memo to the school committee and then them subsequently making uh, requests uh, and requests for consideration of, of you all is just to uh, consider the different projects, think about how this fits with the, 
master plan process that happened several years ago uh, and, and some of the goals that, that the town has relative to recreation in the downtown. Um, and so you know, there was a lot of debate on the, on the committee about you know, an additional ask of a little over $750,000, which the 3C option would require, um, how that fits in, how that plays against the you know, conversations about the operating budget for this year. I see those as different. I think of capital in, in one sort of mindset and, and one view. This is an investment for a very long period of time. Operating budgets are about year over year uh, support of, of the operations of the, of the schools. So I think of them very differently. Uh, but the school committee had a you know robust debate about whether to bring this forward to you, and and I think they ultimately decided that it was better to at least ask uh, and and uh, sort of let you deliberate the way you needed to and and make the decision you want to make. We we're going to try to move ahead with this project. We will move ahead with this project in some form. One of these three most likely, and we'd like to do it for next year's construction season. So we need to get our answers to our designers as quickly as possible. Um, they really need answers basically at the end of June uh, so that they can get uh, through the permitting process and, and, uh, and be able to, to do the due diligence they need to do relative to these kind of uh, preparations uh, and then have the, the documents biddable in the, the late, late fall or early winter uh, so that, that we could do construction next summer. So that's the intention and the timing of some of this as well. Um, so I think at this point I'll, I'll pause and see if you guys have any questions and hopefully that explains part of why you got, you know, sort of this, this uh, series of requests from the school committee. It's really to lay out options in front of you and let you debate and decide what uh, additional funding you may wish to, to uh, put towards this project. Uh, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Okay. So let me pause for a moment and say, so there's three options that we have, okay? Two of these pieces of money, we voted once before, okay? But they had restrictions. So those, the first option at this point for the high school is to just do the track with no additional money from us. We keep the money, okay? The second option is we take the money from CPA and we take the money that we do, did from free cash and through the process of going to CPA for the CPA money and through the process of going to having the finance committee look at both CPA's recommendation and the free cash recommendation, we bring the, the amount up, which allows them to do the second option. The third option is a request for additional money that we would have to come up with, okay? And that is the 756,160. So, all of this will will have to go through the finance committee. That's the first motion we're going to do tonight. But the second motion we're going to do tonight is also is to refer the CPA portion back to CPA for them to decide if they're going to recommend back to us a change in the language. Okay, Kathy. Thank you. Um, so hopefully that makes everything very clear to people. Um, <laughs> First, no, I no, I, no, I agree with what you just said, and I was delighted when I saw these option one and option two, or option one B and option one D, because it's within money that we've already voted. Although, as was pointed out, we have to remove the restrictions on two pieces of the second, and so I think it's um, extremely important to move forward with the money we have, not to hope that there's somehow another seven hundred thousand dollars lying in wait out there, especially given that we're going to have to confront the regional school operating budget and we have other needs for the capital funds. So I, I did note that if we only went for 1B, we wouldn't do a thorough, as I read the specs, we wouldn't do a thorough revamping of the grass field. Um, when you compare the two, one is bringing in new fill, redoing the irrigation system, and that's what drives the cost up, the other 1.7 million. And it seems wise to do that to me. I mean, we'll have a longer term track and field if we do that. It's got ADA paths, it's got lighting. So it's a pretty complete set that's um, 
just fortuitously in within the amount of money we've got if we change those two. So I want to say one other thing about this, um, the master plan that is put forward from us. I never agreed with it. Um, I do understand one of the arguments for reorienting the track, but what the design team that gave us that plan also said is we're destroying the two other fields and you're gonna to have to worry about them when you turn the track and there's no money in it to fix them. So if you look at the current orientation, you're still, whatever we think of the other fields, we're not rotating it in to hurt them. Um, and there were these caveats. So I, I think the field has been played and my kids played on this field a lot. And I know at certain times a day, there's a glare, but it's not the field. I don't think it's, unsurmountable. I played on tennis courts that are oriented in this way. So I, I guess my first point is, I think it's really important. We've waited so long and the teams have nothing to run on right now to move forward with this. And it looks like you've got the money if we do the other, remove the two other restrictions that we would have a fully functional track and a field um, a year or so from now. Um, so that's the one comment I wanted to make. And I wanted to just applaud the school committee and the design firm you found, Doug, for coming up because it's so specific. And you know, it makes me think about the, the school building on how many tons of dirt do you need to bring in and what drainage system that it was extremely specific. And you can see why that extra 1.7. So I'm, I, I'm on the finance committee, but I restate that again on finance. I think 1D is a, strong, thoughtful option that will uh, pay us back for decades to come for our our field. And I'll stop. I'm going to go to Dave Zomack. I should have called on him before. David? Sure, thanks, Lynn. I'll be very brief. Um, no, I just wanted, you know, I know you have the slide deck in your packet, but I just wanted to, you know, kind of... Um, dovetail on some of the things that uh, Dr. Slaughter said. And, you know, we're, we're in a much better position now. I think the council recognizes that when you look at what's been accomplished by SLR with the topographic survey complete, the wetlands delineation complete, soil sampling complete, we have a much better handle um, than we ever have on this field. And that's why the cost estimates and the designs, the, the conceptual designs you saw are, are much tighter than they ever were. What we did with Weston and Sampson a few years ago was really a five or 10,000 foot view of what, what the possibilities uh, are out there. And, and I'm really happy with that work. Um, I just wanted to give credit, of course, to our consultant SLR, but also to Bob Parent, who many of you know is working on capital projects uh, around town and has done a terrific job on this, uh, working with us, with uh, uh, the superintendent and myself. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to mention is um, at the urging of the town manager, I did reach out to Sam McLeod, who's the CPA, um, the chair of the CPA committee uh, la late last week, and he is willing to um, pull the CPA committee together to consider their earlier recommendation to you. So he's poised to do that uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mandy, uh, Councilor Haneke. Um, a couple of questions. Um, am I correct in stating that if um, option three is done, that one of the two sets of money that's already been voted does not need its restrictions removed, and that is the free cash or capital, I think it was from free cash vote, because that restriction was only on a north-south orientation. And so it needs its restriction removed if the council is okay with going forward without a north-south reorientation. Correct. Okay. Um, a couple of other questions. I noticed that the regional school committee asked to come to us and only us and not the other three towns. Um, and so can you expound more on why they are not going to the other three towns for CPA money, particularly for things that in the past you have stated might be able to be pulled out of an initial bid like lighting, um, which on option three is a half million dollars, um, which is nearly enough to make that project if 
restrictions on CPA are removed on turf doable without additional money from Amherst, not completely, there'd be about 250,000 or so to do. Um, and if there is a plan for them to go to CPA to CPAs and the other towns for any other money, and if there is not, um, how does cost sharing work when, if I did my calculations right, and you take out the one and a half million dollars that all towns have agreed to borrow, um, 80% of the rest would be about 500,000 less than um, the amount that you're asking Amherst to use. And so if the region breaks up, if there are other issues, if um, other things, if it happens, and, and that's a, an option three, obviously it's a little less for options 1D. Um, what is Amherst going to be preferentially given some preferential treatment on cost of using the new track or the field or things like that? Like, how's that sort of cost sharing going to work if we're not cost sharing with the other towns in the region? Um, has that been thought about? Um, and the next question is, what is the expectation on maintenance if options 1D or 3 are done for the town of Amherst, given that, or even option 1B in terms of would maintenance expect costs be expected to be increased and would that be expected to be borne by the town of Amherst's DPW? So uh, your first question was around CPA at the other towns. Um, there's a small amount that, that Pelham has kicked in because it was in process when the pandemic hit in 2020. So uh, they had approved that. Um, really, it's a question of timing. Uh, the CPA cycle for the other towns is, is you know, late fall, winter, and we're looking to go to bid, and you can't bid on a project without cash in hand to do it. So uh, it's really about not delaying the project any further. Um, you know, is it a circumstance where we could um, potentially go back to the towns and ask for CPA funds to do something else, which would, you know, in a, in a bid process might be an ad alternate type of thing. Um, we could certainly look at that as we go through the design process. Um, the thing to keep in mind is if we use, uh, you know, a sort of similar uh, scaling of, of cost that, that we do for our, our usual capital projects, um, the three towns combined only amount to about 20%. So it, it would be a fairly modest kind of add to the, to the total dollars. Um, but it's really as much about timing as anything else. They're, they're not as often, uh, or actually really kind of rarely do they have a fall town meeting in, in Leverett, Pelham and Shutesbury. So, um, you know the the timing of that relative to to uh, the the need to get to buildable and, and biddable documents is is the primary thing there. Um, on the second question, which was now that I'm thinking about it, I'm losing track. Um, uh, which was I think proximity matters a lot. Uh, in other words, we have not restricted access to the fields, nor do we expect to, as far as the field and track. And so the fact that it's in the town of Amherst makes a big difference. Um, and I think that's one of the key things to keep in mind is that it it physically resides in town. And that's a big deal to those other three communities because they don't have access to it. You've got to drive 20 minutes to get here. You're not likely to come and use that field. Their kids use it, even in their participation through our Amherst Recreation programs. Um, and they will continue to do so, but we also charge them additional fees for that. Um, so I think that the, the proximity of it to downtown and the fact that it's in the city limits is is an argument for you know the town of Amherst holding a bit more. It's it is thought of and and often used as a as an Amherst resource. So um, I think that's one way to argue the 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 ask. Um, and I think the third question, which is just sort of what happens if if um, uh, we were we were going to sort of split this differently, sort of what the costs are like and whether the town of Amherst. So, you know, we have an ongoing relationship with the town DPW around field maintenance. We do some things, they do some things. We try to be very cognizant of that. Um, and as I said, the finance committee, I think, or maybe just in conversation, I forget now. Um, I think we have to look at that, at, you know, as we as we look at this renovation of this field, we have to look at, at that, that level of effort um, and, and um, and whether it's still fair. Um, you know, the thing is that, you know, a fair number of Amherst rec programs work and, and occur on, on the fields at the, at the uh, regional schools, and we're happy to host those. And often that's, you know, not done at a cost, 
uh, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. It depends on the circumstance, but a lot of them operate in ways that that don't we don't charge the town for, and therefore, you know, it's sort of a quid pro quo circumstance a little bit. But obviously, if this field requires a uh, higher level of maintenance or um, a limit, you know, more limited amounts of play, that sort of thing, then we have to really uh, look at that that usage and and what's fair and what's fair for the town to you know carry and considering and cover versus uh, versus the regional schools. Um, I think the question of you know, just more broadly back to the question of like if the region were to split in some way, uh, those assets are owned by the four towns right now. And so if if uh, and this is true of the buildings as well as the grounds. So if if there were some sort of uh, division of the of the region, uh, there would have to be some sort of appropriate uh, compensation to those towns for those assets that are owned by those that would have to then be uh, taken over by the by the town of Amherst. So it wouldn't be um, the the ownership to to Amherst for whether it be buildings or grounds wouldn't be free to the town of Amherst. It would have to be some sort of arrangement with those other towns to get uh, some recoupment of their uh, equity. That's a thing to keep in mind. Just more broadly, that's not as as specific to tonight's thing, but but just generally thinking about you know regional schools because uh, there are some regions where buildings are still owned by the municipalities in which they reside. In our case, the the regional buildings and grounds are owned by the regional school district uh, and are an asset for all four communities. Okay, Bob Hagner. Yeah, I wanted to uh, echo Councillor Haneke's concerns um, about. The fact that only Amherst has been asked for additional funding for uh, the option 1D or, or 3C, excuse me. Um, and I know when we looked at this, when the Finance Committee looked at this uh, in February, there, we, we identified approximately $240,000 of CPA funds that may be available from Pelham, Shutesbury, and Leverett. Uh, but they were restricted to grass options, which we seem to be, all of these are grass options. So I'm, my question is, I mean, if it's a timing issue, why is it a timing issue for the three towns and not a timing issue for Amherst? Um, it, you know, we have, we have our own, our own schedule. Um, and, you know, we just finished our, our capital improvement plan and this wasn't included in it. And it's going to be another year before we can we can look at our capital projects and see whether we could fit this in or not. So I, I don't see how we can actually do this other than to pull the eight hundred thousand and the nine hundred thousand or pull the restrictions on those uh, and go with option one uh, D. I don't see how we can come up with the 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 the, the money to do uh, option three. Um, within the, the, the resources that we have. So I, the question, a specific question I have is why haven't, why hasn't the committee reached out to the other three towns for the money that they had said they might be able to provide? Okay. So I think that, that uh, there's a couple of pieces to puzzle to that puzzle. Um, so First, just around the timing question, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's off cycle. You know, the the fortunate thing for Amherst with a with a council form of government is that there's a little more flexibility to consider things. Uh, granted, there isn't there is a formal cycle in time that you you do things, and you do have the flexibility due to regular meeting schedules of the appropriating authority uh, to take things up out of cycle if you choose to. And again, you know, I think the 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 committee was fully aware that this was an off cycle ask and and uh, and an atypical kind of thing. And so uh, it was really just, it, it was uh, aspirational, I guess is the word I would use in that regard. Um, as far as the uh, the other towns, uh, you know, the, the uh, CPA is really the only other funding that they would have available. Uh, yes, they did indicate that if a grass only option was was available, they might be more willing to consider it. Um, I think the, the, the couple of things I would say as far as that's concerned. One is that uh, when we would have been asking for those CPA funds, we were not fully resolved to the, the grass interior field option. And one of the reasons besides money uh, for a, a grass interior field option has to do with uh, changes to both the Board of Health and the Conservation Commission's approach to uh, non-natural surfaces 
uh, which have also evolved over the course of the last few months. So I think both of those are are ways in which this has changed the dynamic and changed the dynamic in a time frame that didn't allow us to really uh, work back through uh, those other CPA committees. Pam Rooney. Thank you, appreciate these comments. Um, I will echo uh, some of what has already been said, but uh, in effect, the money that we committed previously puts, puts this project uh, in the ballpark for the option 1D. Um, two things, if we, if we continue to support it at that level, um, I'm, I'm interested in having someone go back to the other committees, other communities, excuse me, and look for an opportunity to, to perhaps be reimbursed to some minor degree um, for contributions that perhaps they could make. Um, even even though, as you said, there are 20% of, of maybe the contributions. In comparing the various options, uh, it does strike me that 1D is preferable in my, in my estimation for a couple of reasons. And one is that living almost immediately adjacent to this field and to the track, um, I heard many reports from neighbors who were very clear about the fact that during the construction of the original track back in 91, 92, that there were some issues going on and that the, the field within the track was not laid properly and therefore that has been a cause, root cause, of just a lot of the maintenance issues of that grass playing field. Not that it was grass, it was just poorly built. So seeing in 1D that you are actually excavating, relaying, and laying the groundwork for a well-constructed uh, new field is very different than rototilling and reseeding um, a surface that's already not good and is not, and is not supported below grade as well. Um, in a con uh, um, response to one of the things about the lighting, it looks like though in both of these options, 1B and D, there is some cost for lighting and that amounts to about a little over 300,000. So it's not a full savings of $500,000 that, that the option C would cost us. So it's, it's, it's relocating and, and changing out to LED rather than new poles, new lighting. Um, and then lastly, I would, um, I would ask that there be some additional pressure on the boosters who appear to have uh, roughly $100,000 in hand. Um, seems like they could do better. The, I know the boosters are the ones that actually built or had installed the existing lighting and it was strictly um, on the backs of the boosters that did that kind of work. So I would look to the boosters to boost their efforts. <laughs> Jennifer? Yes, so I was very happy to see 1D as an option that the funds, if they are released, um, if the restrictions are released from both the CPA and the town, that that could move forward. I would, of course, you know, love to see 3C, but um, I, I would vote to approve 1D, and I don't know if the Finance Committee might if there is time for the finance committee to look to see if there might be a way to make 3C happen. But um, I would support 3D and not wanting the whatever perfect to be the enemy of the good. But I did want to ask in terms of the other towns. Could you please meet? Me. Okay. Can, can they ha have special meetings? I mean, could they call a special meeting to, to appropriate um, additional CPA funds? They can. I mean, technically, yes. I mean, the the thing is to call a town meeting, though, is is um, not a trivial exercise. I guess would be the way I would describe it. There's a there's associated cost with calling a town meeting, so they tend to do it really only when they have to, um, and it would be unbudgeted for them. The the you know, the annual town meeting they have to have, so they sort of plan for that one. They do and have. I mean, uh, not last January, but January before, Suitsbury had a uh, an issue with with their um, Drinking water and PFAS, uh, where they called a special town meeting in January to to appropriate some funding, 
Uh, so they can do it. It's, um, you know, it's not unheard of, but I think it generally tends to be much more urgent or emergent problems that they do that for. And emergencies. Yeah. Okay. George Ryan. So this is an opportunity for us to make an investment in our future. And once again, we're probably not going to do it. Um, since 2019, there's been a master plan to try and improve our recreational facilities in the center of our town. And as the acting superintendent pointed out in his memo, the north-south reorientation of the track was a significant element of that design. If you actually speak to the people who use the facility, you speak to the athletes and to their families, um, the one thing that they have asked for over and over, well, there are two things they asked for. One was to use uh, the synthetic turf for many good economic reasons, which were supported in the original master plan document. And the other was to reorient the track. Um, and now that looks like it's gonna be kicked to the side. Um, the interim superintendent has pointed out in his memo why this is a good idea, why it would make a difference once we make the decision to keep the track as it is. That basically puts an end to most of the master planning. I assume all of you have read the master plan and are familiar with it. It's obviously aspirational, but a key element of that is the reorientation of the track. I don't mean to make light of the challenge of finding that money at this time. That's a very serious problem. And maybe that will be finally what decides the matter, but that for me will be a very sad moment. We have a chance to make an investment in our future. We can find the damn money. Um, maybe we have to go back to these towns and say, look, you didn't want uh, synthetic turf. Now you've got your grass field. Help us make this something that over time, maybe not in our term, maybe not in the next term, but at some point, some of the things that we hope for in terms of our recreational fields could possibly be done. But if we go ahead with what has been suggested so far this evening, that's just not going to happen. It's cheaper, but it lacks vision and it doesn't really address the deeper issue that the master plan tried to address. I'm going to go to counselors that haven't spoken yet on a Devlin Gothian. I was a proponent of the original restriction on um, the dollars that Amherst was contributing being contingent on a north-south orientation um, for many reasons that have already been stated, but I can't, I can't support this if we keep it in its current orientation. It can't, it does not work when it's east-west facing. We only benefit one sport and sure that we get a nice, we get new blades of grass in the middle but those athletes aren't seeing dividends from this that are significant enough to warrant the cost of that it's going to take. And that will last us for decades to come. So for me, this locks us in to something that we are not benefiting enough students to warrant the cost. And I want this track to be done, but it needs to be reoriented. Our form of government should not box us in to paying an unequal proportionate share of these projects. That's insane. Other towns need to be able to come forward with their CPAs and call to special town meetings. And they should have done this before when they knew that their first CPA wasn't going to go through. They've had a town meeting since that point, I think. Yeah. So this shouldn't be falling on us the way that it is. And I'm frustrated once again, that something is falling on us that shouldn't be falling on us the way it is, but I cannot support this without that reorientation. That's half the, that, that's half of what makes this worth doing is moving this so that the athletes that use that field in the center, which if I'm reading this correctly, the reorientation also calls for revitalization of that field to the left of that reoriented. Kathy, I see you, I see you, I see you. Um, it calls for the revitalization of the field in the middle. And then it identifies where that additional field can go on the left. There's opportunity in that option three. Option two locks us in once again for decades. And our council in 20 years will have to pay multi-millions of dollars and try to avoid the mistake that we can avoid now. 
Dave Zomek, you have your hand up. Yes, I, I just wanted to maybe add that I appreciate all the comments. I appreciate the discussion. Um, but I also wanted to, to just note that we specifically did not have our consultant SLR here tonight. We did not have the designers here. We anticipated a referral to finance committee and where a deeper conversation about some of these issues could, could take place, including what will be the state of the field if, if there is a way to get to the uh, 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 3C, what, how will the fields to the left, to the west be um, redone? So I feel a little bit unprepared. Um, I think we would have had SLR here if I knew we were gonna go into such detail. So I'm just putting that out there that we fully intend to have SLR come to the finance committee meeting um, if there is a referral. So I just wanted to, to say that, um, that we have much more detail. We can speak to, um, our designers can speak to those kinds of issues. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, you've not spoken. I don't have a lot to say. Um, I support uh, 3C. I support the reorientation of the track and I've wrestled with this. Um, I feel like um, athletics, for some people, really empowers them. It empowers their education in other areas. Um, and if we're talking about empowering our youth here in Amherst, if we're willing to put ARPA money aside for youth empowerment, why are we not considering this really vital and important change to facilitate um, our students, our, our youth? Um, and for me, yes, we need to step forward aggressively to talk with the other towns. And I have a feeling that could be a positive outcome. <clears throat> but we've wasted more than $700,000 in the last five years over a series of projects that were half cooked. This is not half cooked. It's an important, important and valuable change for our community and the other towns communities. Okay, um, let me just mention, this is a referral to finance. There will be a further discussion there. And when the finance comes back, uh, if these are questions that need to be answered about the other towns or uh, about uh, where the money would come from for reorientation, et cetera. So is there, let's see if there's any additional questions about referrals. I do have one and that is to just, make sure I understand. The additional money from free cash is already available. It's real cash. The money from CPA, I believe, was going to be borrowed. So I just want to make sure people understand that's not money sitting around. That's money that has to be borrowed. Uh, the other point is that if there are any other features that uh, might be added down the road, I would ask that the plan that make sure that those features, for example, do we need additional conduits for lights? Do we need something done so that bleachers can be added? Those kinds of features that we make sure that when the track and the field is actually done, those can still be done with additional money should it become available. Um, I'm, I'm trying to see, Bob, have you spoken yet? I, I have spoken, but I, I, I have a question about when we, the finance committee needs to come back with a recommendation on this. We have a pretty busy schedule. We only have meetings scheduled for June 4th, 11th and 18th. We've got three referrals now that need to get back to the council for the 17th. So we have to deal with them between the 4th and the 11th. And now we're getting another thing that is gonna take up a whole meeting. Um, so what's the, what? when do we need to, have a recommendation back to the council. In this case, we would like the 17th. And the reason being is that we're trying to stay in lockstep with the actual construction so that we don't delay the vote to the extent that the construction can't take place next spring. That's, we're caught between that issue of us voting 
so that they know which plan to go forward with and still have enough time to complete the design so that they're ready to go in the spring. Okay. Kathy, you have your hand up. Then I'll, I'm gonna build on Bob's question for Doug and Dave. Um, we'll try to figure out how to squeeze it into finance as soon as possible. In the project schedule that we have is the preliminary design is May through July with a hope that it would get permitted and then it would be bid in October. So we're under a timeline of these numbers change if we push this off six months, if we push it off a year. Um, so, so just on a, that's a tight timeline. Then um, it would be helpful, Dave, you know, for the option three, um, I don't know what other world people are living on, on our budget, but we don't have the money. Um, and even our share of the additional money, if we do the orientation, it's a gun, not no go. These other towns are paying only 20% of the first 1.5. I mean, we have it as if we're all equal. We're not equal. Amherst, because of the size of our group, we, we pay a good 80%. So I think we can't be, um, we're going to be faced a request for a regional school increase. We have unmet other capital needs. We don't have the money. We're in a deficit situation next year. So unless we're just saying we're not going to be able to do the track for another year because we're going out and fundraising. So I just want to have it be clearer on the timeline, Dave and Doug, on this is a go. Because this designer, the one of the interesting things about the three, their fee is not increasing for the more expensive project. So they're ready to move on this. They're just saying, we're going to give you a guaranteed fee um, that that's not going to stay. So we have an opportunity to move forward on this. And it is a long term, as Anna and others have said, this once we do it, we've done it. Um, so I don't think it has the dire consequences, but I already made that statement. So the last thing is on three there's a debate on how much of the repair of the other fields. My understanding is it's just reseeding, not returning them to playing fields. And that's, we're spending an enormous amount of money in the school project to return them to playing fields, not just to put grass in. So it would be good to get an answer to that question when we reorient, how much of the other fields do we lose? Um, lose in terms of playing fields, not in terms of nice grassy fields. So that'd be my two, the, the tightness of this timeline. So then Bob, we're gonna have to figure out how we schedule it in sooner rather than later because they wanna move on with design starting in May and we're at the end of May. Thanks. Mandy Jo. Um, I think when this comes to finance, we need from our town manager options on how to find that extra 700,000 for C, because we don't even have them in front of us, right? For item three, not, <laughs> I guess it's not C, it's three. Option three, because we don't even have that in front of us right now. And we can't have a discussion at finance unless we know where it's possible to come from. Um, I want to echo Anna's frustration with the region and this project. We were told we had to act immediately in February and that we couldn't wait and the region needed to know if that authorization at one and a half would be there because they needed to know they had the funds. Everything that comes to us seems to be an emergency with them. Yet in February, we pushed for, why aren't you going to CPAs in the other town? And it's now May and they still haven't gone to CPAs. They seem to have given it up despite that in February, cost estimates and revenue estimates included CPA funds. I think you're seeing that frustration here where the council is being asked to do stuff on really tight timelines by the school committee and the school committee just uses, the other towns have a town meeting and so we can't go to them as what I see now is just a frustrating excuse. Um, yes, it's great that they're coming back to us because I know two and a half years ago, I said, come back to us if you need more money um, because of the reorientation and the need for reorientation. But it's extremely frustrating that the school committee seems to have 
given up on asking the other towns for any portion of it, including a portion of lighting that might not need to go out to contract in November or doesn't need to be funded maybe now because you could be going to CPAs in the other towns. They all have November town meetings. They all have special town meetings in November. You could potentially ask. And so I just want to just again reiterate, I think there's a number of us that are very frustrated with how this project has proceeded and who is being asked to shoulder the full or near full burden. And after the one and a half million, option three is 2.7 million more, a half a million dollars is less than 20% of that. And so a half million dollars is not insubstantial of cost sharing that we're being asked to put on our town's taxpayers instead of the other three towns. Andy? Andy, I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess that I'm troubled by something that hasn't actually been talked about much. I think this is a capital expense. Uh, it is uh, one that raises uh, charter questions because capital expenditures under the charter come to us from the town manager upon in, in the capital improvement plan upon a recommendation um, of the uh, joint capital planning committee. So that uh, I'm not sure that it would even be appropriate for us to make a commitment of additional capital funds for this purpose without going through the process that is prescribed by the charter. And I know that that's frustrating for the people who have advocated very clearly for option three, but um, I do think we need to step back and say, we have problems too in what are our restrictions on our government one of them is our charter. Alicia, uh, Councilor Walker. Um, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to state that I do support referring this to the Finance Committee, um, and I hope that we can get a more in-depth look at what the options will look like for us. Um, and I think a lot of counselors brought up very valid concerns, um, some of which we need more information to be able to really investigate and look at. And so I'm hoping that that information, should this be referred to finance committee, can be made available to us for the finance committee meeting. Um, and then I'm wondering if we're saying, we're talking about the share and the, the other towns having a portion of this going for the other option that we would like to, that we have talked about liking to see, wanting to see happen, who would make that request? Like, can we say we would like I don't know if we can instruct the school committee to do anything, but can we say we would like for them to reach out to the other towns and see what other possibilities exist? Because I think getting that information as to whether or not the town, the other towns are willing to contribute will influence our decision is what I'm hearing at this point. And so is that something else that we can get information on before our finance committee meeting? I know that's probably not very likely because they would have to call um, a meeting, but can we start moving those things so that we can get a better idea of what's possible? Um, because it sounds like a lot of counselors here are in favor of going for the reorientation. And I do agree that, that that's a great investment for our town and for our youth. Um, but I'm also in this place where I'd rather see something happen than nothing happen. And so I think like we need more information. We need to be reaching out to the other towns to see what's possible. And we need to be exploring as the town of Amherst, if there's any more money that we can find, how much is it, where is it, and what then would be the deficit if we do have any more to contribute. Um, but I am in favor of referring and of removing the restrictions. I would love to see this project move along as quickly as possible. Okay. Given that, I'm going to make a motion, seek a second. And let me just point out that the motion in this case for the referral to the finance committee means all three issues are referred to the finance committee. Okay. 
uh, to refer the regional school committee requests related to the Amherst Regional High School track and fields project to the finance committee with a report and recommendation to the town council by June 17th, 2024. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Okay, are there any further discussions on this motion of referral? Can I ask that the um, finance committee chair keep the council appraised of when this is on the finance committee agenda as we go forward? For those of us who are not sure. on the committee. We'll thanks. thanks, Bob. Thank you. Alicia? Um, yeah, so that was what my statement was an actual question. So can we ask that the other towns be reached out to? Is that something we can formally do? Because uh, I would I would like that to happen also. I think we need to re ask the uh, superintendent to go back to the school committee and have them do that, uh, re that outreach. Okay. Okay. And is that something that we need to make a motion to do, or we can just say it? I think he's heard the message. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's shaking his head. Yes. Sorry. Yes. All right. Uh, we're going to begin the vote then with Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Topp. Yes. Councillor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lords absent. Pam Rooney. Yes. It's unanimous. 12 in favor. One absent for referral to the Finance Committee. The next motion is to refer the Regional School Committee request to remove specific project specific restrictions on the Community Preservation Act appropriation of $800,000 related to the Amherst Regional High School track and fields project to the Community Preservation Act committee with a report and recommendation to the town council by June 17th, 2024. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Um, just a similar question to what Andy said of that original project request came from the regional school. So instead of it coming from us, why isn't the regional school requesting directly to the CPA the um, removal of the restrictions? Um, good question, <coughs> except that uh, we voted, yes. You guys appropriated. We, we did the appropriation. Yeah, that, that was, thank you, Doug, for confirming what I was thinking. Okay, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I'm going to move to a vote. Uh, Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Jennifer Taub? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Patty Angelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? No. No. Um, Councillor Ette? Aye. Lynn Greesmers, aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. Councillor Lords absent. Uh, Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. The vote's 11 in favor, one opposed, and one absent. Uh, Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will also, Andy, going back to your question, check with the town manager as to whether or not we need to come up with some more a formal referral document from the town manager, given that it's a capital expense. Okay. So I, I think he needs to present a financial order. Financial order. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there moving on? Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you Appreciate all for listening. It. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Um, we are going to now look at the establishment of a commission on disabilities. And I'm going to place the motion on the table and then we'll move to it. I wanna recognize that we have two people with us tonight, Myra Ross and uh, DEI Director Pamela Young. Uh, the motion is to accept the provisions of Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40, Paragraph 8J, relative to the establishment of the Municipal Commission on Disability, to dissolve the Disability Access Advisory Committee, to accept the provisions of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40, Paragraph 22G, and to designate Commission on Disability members as special municipal employees. Is there a second? 
Thank you, Angelus. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? And uh, actually, um, either Pamela Young or uh, Myra, were there any comments you wanted to make in advance? Uh, sure. Thank you. This um, this has been something um, that has been requested um, internally for quite some time, um, only because a committee is a short-term solution or a sh short-term body aimed at the solution of a question. This is a long-term uh, committee. It's already been in existence for more than 30 years, and it really should be a commission under the uh, 8J, Section 8J, um, because I guess it's supposed to give importance and status to the needs of people with all kinds of disabilities. Um, if you if you approve 22G, that enables us to collect some funds from the uh, handicapped parking fines and also enables us to establish an account into which uh, private funds can be deposited as well as any appropriations that the town might choose to make. Apparently, um, the town appropriations obviously would dissolve after the year would go with the fiscal year regulations, but any monies that were to come from private donations and from the parking funds would be able to accumulate over time so that we could fund projects um, after a while that the town isn't able to fund. Um, and that might come up because they're important for some group of people with disabilities. So we're hopeful that you will um, make us into a commission. I don't know the percentage of towns that actually has commissions, but I think it's more than half. It's not something that's unique. Um, it's um, We're sort of late in the game and I'm hopeful that you will do it. There isn't any money attached necessarily except the 22G for the parking, uh, for the fines for the handicap parking violations. Okay. Uh, oh, I will just say, I will just say that we ask um, that actually that you do this in a way to honor Joe Tringali, who has was on the committee for many of the 30 years and who passed away recently, but this was really a thing that he kept asking for. And um, there was a big write-up in the Boston Globe recently about him. We were very fortunate to have somebody who was that um, successful an advocate for people with disabilities in Amherst. And it would just be nice to do it in his memory. Thank you, Myra. Uh, Pamela, any comments at this time? No, I, I think uh, Myra did a wonderful job of, of reviewing all of the points um, for making this decision. Thank you, and thanks for joining us. Uh, Bob Hegner, go ahead. Yes, uh, I, I do support uh, establishing the commission, but I do have a question on how much money the commission would feel it would need to raise over whatever period of time in order to be able to do the things that the commission wants to do. So I admire with your permission, I'll, I can try to answer that. So. Yep. Um, it will really depend on the project. So, mm -hmm. um, for example, when we when the DAC started having conversations with the Massachusetts Office on Disability, one of their representatives, who's in situate, said that uh, they collected money for three or four years, and one of the projects that they um, have funded was creating a pathway to one of their local beaches that would make it handicap accessible. So it's really uh, the amount or the funds needed are gonna be project dependent. There's not a specific um, amount that we we have in mind or that the uh, that the committee has in mind. Thank you. Agreed. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Myra. Councillor Haneke. Um, a couple of questions. 
And then just one comment on the charge. On the charge, the charge doesn't seem to exactly follow Section 8J, the draft charge, uh, which to me doesn't make a lot of sense. It seems to be missing items three and four and maybe item six of Section 8J. I'm not sure why we changed the wording in the draft charge from the section in the MGLs. Um, so I would just suggest following the MGL wording and then adding and supplementing where necessary. Um, appears, and I'd like to be corrected if I'm wrong, it appears that the expenditure of money operates would operate similarly to the CPA expenditure of money. Um, I am curious, section 22G states that a city is authorized to allocate funds if we accept section 22G, but not that it shall. So I'm curious how that authorization works if we accept section 22G. Is it just part of the budget every year or you know, how would we see that um, allocation into this special fund that, that is kept? Um, and how would that allocation, presumably those funds now go into our transportation fund, enterprise fund, how would that allocation out of the transportation enterprise fund affect the ability of the enterprise fund to fund its current expense obligations? I think I can answer two of them. Okay. Please, Myra, go ahead, and then I'll go. Um, to the first one, um, I can't tell you why the language was changed, because the language that we proposed, I pretty much took out of the statute. So someone else has to tell you why they took them out, but it didn't come from uh, us. And the uh, the other question, I think part of the budget process, most of the needs that would be funded through any of these allocations would be per capita. I can't imagine very much being for operating. So it could go through joint capital planning. Um, it could, you know, because that's where your capital monies go. Um, and it, um, I think we would make requests as we do um, currently, but there would be maybe more uh, consideration of some of the things that we would need on an ongoing basis um, because we, you know, we'd have a little bit of a seat at the table more than we do now. It's not gonna be a big seat. I don't mean to say that, um, but I think it would pretty much be capital requests. Pamela, do you have additional? So uh, the only additional comment I would make is that our uh, the analysis that Jen LaFountain did of the parking fines um, would indicate that it would have a small impact on the budget. It's generally between we think between like a three and five thousand dollars a year, so not a lot of money um, overall for their budget. Okay. All right. Did you have follow up questions, Councilor Haneke? Um. How does how does the money get into the trust account? Because it doesn't seem to be an automatic into given the statutory language of may allocate. I think it says is authorized to allocate funds. So how does it actually make it into the trust? Pamela? So I, I can, uh, it's a, we're sad that Jen wasn't able to uh, join us tonight, Jen LaFountain. Um, however, it, I believe that although the language does not specifically say shall, uh, the statute operates um, under that, um, language. So there is a process in place which uh, Jen um, automatically identifies what the parking fines are that are associated with fines for um, handicapped parking spots. So it's very it would be very clear for her easy to make the distinction of like this fine fine came in for this purpose and then to make um, the transfer or the allocation. Um, so that on that's my best answer. I know it's not a precise one, but I um, it is my understanding that it operates under as if the language was shall. Okay. That that's helpful and actually answers one of my questions because it, uh, I mean, for example, when we do CPA funds, we often put money into the affordable housing trust, and so in some ways, there is some in this case an automatic transfer that would show on in the budget as a transfer to uh, because of the parking fines for handicapped space. 
that's how I'm understanding. Can I, can I clarify that a little bit, please? Please, yes. So, um, please speak to the our, mic. Our our treasurer would create a separate account for those fees to be. That it wouldn't require a council action to transfer the funds into that account. Right. And then any gifts to the disability access, I'm sorry, the commission on disabilities would go into that account as well. And like Myra mentioned, they would be rolled over if there were an appropriation into that account, then it wouldn't be rolled over if it were part of the budget. We envisioned when we spoke about this with Pamela and Myra and um, treasurer Jen LaFountain that um, it would either come when the Commission on Disabilities were ready to make a recommendation about the use of those funds. It would either come in a cycle similar to the CPA process or depending on the timing, it could be included in the budget. So that would be an appropriation with approval from the council. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Kathy? Um, I, th I think I just heard another clarification that was helpful to me. This is parking fines for just the handicapped spaces. Mm -hmm. That's yes. That's you know, when I first read it, it was all the parking fines, but it's just restricted to that. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's a bigger pot of money, Myra, that yeah. makes it, yeah, yeah, yeah. makes it a bigger <laughs> issue. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, seeing no more questions, I'm going to move to the vote. Uh, we begin this vote with, um, are we up to Andy Steinberg? Yes, Andy. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Uh, Councillor Walker. Yes. Patty Angels. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Greesburg. Aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. <clears throat> Councillor Lords absent. Uh, Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. It's unanimous with one absent. Myra well, and Pamela, thank you. thank you for joining us. And a special note, Pamela, thanks for all the fine work yesterday for the AAPI event. It was well attended and a great event. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And thank you for this. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for your support. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, thank you. Go for it. Yeah. Um, okay, our next and last item on the action items is acceptance of Mass General Law Chapter 44, Section 32, Submission of City Budget to City Council pro Procedure for Approval, Rejection, or Alteration. Let me, before I make this motion, just mention this only creates an option. It doesn't make a promise, okay? It creates the option that we can, in fact, give the schools or more than we have proposed in the town manager's budget. It doesn't mean we're going to, it just creates the ability to do so. And if we don't pass this, it does, we don't have that ability, okay? So the motion is in seeking a second to accept the provisions of Mass General Law, chapter 44, paragraph 32, section two of chapter 329, of the acts of 1987. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? Yes, Mandy Jo. I, I just wanna reiterate um, what the president just said that my vote to a, accept this provision should not be construed as a pre-vote on whether the action of the regional school committee that has been asked of us to increase the allotment from the manager's budget will happen or is favored to happen or anything. I think we need to leave that option open as we continue discussions in finance. So I will be supporting this because we should leave the option open and voting no eliminates that option, but it should not, my vote should not be seen as um, an inherent support for what the regional school committee has asked. Lynn, may I please um, add something? Yes. Um, so this would allow the council to take this option any year. It's not a yearly requirement. The, the council adopt this general law. So this is a Thank statute you. available by the town and would be available in future years as well. Right. And we want to thank the clerk for the research on this. Thank you so much. Kathy Shane. Um, that actually answers my question. Thank you, Athena, because um, when I saw this, I wondered why we didn't see it a year ago when there was an $85,000 extra request. And we were told we could do it, 
because it was a school, but we didn't have this. So this, this once we do it, it remains an option. That's Thank correct. You. Pat DeAngelis. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can support this. I've been wrestling with it uh, because we're all talking about, oh, we can take, we can increase. Well, then you have to reduce the budget somewhere else. And this doesn't change that. And to quote my mother, who was um, a factory worker, it's taking money from Peter to pay Paul. And I don't like that. Um, I'm beginning to think that um, we don't value the work that goes into the budget and the thinking that goes into the budget. Um, and I, I just, I feel like we play with money um, and that makes me uncomfortable. Okay. So I will not support. Are there any other comments? Okay, uh, we are going to move to a vote on this. And in this case, Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councilor Walker. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. No. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Yes. Lynn Griesper is an aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner. Aye. <clears throat> Pam Rooney. Yes. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. The motion passes 11 in favor, one opposed, and one absent. We have no appointments, so we are going to move to committee and liaison reports, and then on to the rest of the items on the agenda. So community resources committee, Pam Rooney and Jennifer Tom yes. is vice chair. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry, Pat, you still have your hand up. Thank you, okay. You're welcome to speak. Uh, yeah. CRC, the the uh, report that was in the packet is actually has a uh, a mistake in it. It says the committee met on, on May 5. It should have said May 14. The rest is okay. But we would ask again if there are folks out there in your districts uh, who might be encouraged to apply, put their name in with a citizen activity form for the planning board, we would like to wrap this up in the next couple of weeks, obviously, to get ahead of the end of the fiscal year and have someone um, in place for July 1. Thank you. Elementary School Building Committee, Kathy Shane and Councillor uh, Walker. The, um, I didn't submit a written report, but I should send everyone, and so we can put it in the town council pocket, packet, the report we saw on Friday which is the estimates came in two and a half million dollars below the budget cap that we had set. So we now, and that sits now as additional contingency money. We already had a healthy contingency of, of about five million. And even with the estimates, there's still contingency in design. So we have a real buffer. So we're on our way to bidding in early July. We, we have very detailed um, very detailed, uh, very, very detailed, like 2,000 pages worth of details and drawing. So the other thing about, I just want to sing the praises of the design team because they got comments from the cost estimators and also a member of our committee who is an architect that said that the level of detail specificity that they received was stunning. Um, that it was just really, really well done. And all the questions, someone who went through it and spent 30 hours on it, he came up with a couple questions that were answerable. Um, so it's, we've got a really good team working for us. And a good OPM. Uh, Finance Committee, Bob Hegner. Uh, yeah, we're continuing to review the budget. We should be have that wrapped up by uh, our last meet, our meeting on June 4th, um, and we will have a, a report to submit. Uh, hopefully we'll get that done um, by the 4th as well. Okay, uh, GOL, Anna Devlin got here. 
So GOL has a meeting this coming week, but at our last meeting, we established the interview dates for our um, Charter Review Committee and Finance Committee openings. Uh, and so we are currently uh, soliciting statements of interest from those folks who had submitted a uh, CAF to us. And um, I want to appreciate Lynn and George for, for taking the lead on this while I was away last week. Um, this coming week, we will be tackling the nuisance bylaw and uh, we can expect to uh, likely have some things to send back to C uh, CRC um, after we get through with it, but we are taken, we're, we finally got to it, so we're getting there. Um, and we have been continuing to move through resolutions, citations, proclamations, et cetera. Uh, and we've got town manager evaluation on the horizon coming up soon. Jennifer? So I guess you said you have the dates for the um, Charter Review Committee? We do, yeah. So it once once folks send in their SOIs, it's looking like the week of the fourth, um, the Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, are the two days that we're hoping to hold interviews on. And uh, but that's dependent on when folks sign up for interview slots and how many. Kathy, um, I I might have missed it, Anna, Anna, but we have a vacancy on the finance committee. Are there? applicants for it. I mean, it's been since Bob became a council member yep. in January. So I just didn't know where that sits. Yeah. So we are hoping to do those interviews um, on the week of the 11th of June. Um, and so we, it took a while to get the pool sufficient um, for a long time. We didn't have folks sending in calves for it. So the pool was deemed sufficient um, and we are currently soliciting the statements of interest from the folks who put their name into that pool as well. And if I go to one of the committee packets, will I see who has applied? Um, the CAFs are posted in the SharePoint folder, but I don't know if, yeah, Athena, thank you. Okay. I, uh, I think just, Athena, I Athena just, has a cleaner can answer just for send you. Me a, someone can send me a link afterwards. I missed, I missed that. Thanks. Athena, did you have a comment? Um, the CAFs aren't public records, Kathy, so they're not in a public packet. Um, the GOL SharePoint, I don't believe is accessible to non-GOL members. I can send you a list if you don't have in your email the CAFs as, when they're automatically sent to each counselor, but I can generate a list for you if you'd like to see who's applied to the finance committee. And then once we've, uh, once the committee's received the statements of interest, those will be posted at the time the meeting is posted in accordance with the council's policy on making recommendations for appointments to multiple member bodies. Thanks. And I just want to make sure that if anybody is interested in either of these two committees, they can continue to submit yes. CAFs until... They can do that until for finance, it'll be June 5th, and they can continue to submit CAFs for charter review until May 24th. A point of order, oh. it, they, they could submit a CAF earlier... Um, th but they would need to submit a statement of interest by those deadlines. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Both things would be due that day. Thanks, Athena. And I just want to mention this because I have sent out 19 emails to people interested in the 2024 Charter Review Committee, and only four people have scheduled interviews. So I would suggest that the door is still open, and um, we don't know about finance yet. I'll be sending a reminder out tomorrow, not to worry. Um, okay, uh, moving on to um, Jones Library. Thank you. Um, so the trustees and the Jones Library Building Com Committee are fairly intertwined these days since the receipt of the bid um, for the library project. The trustees actually voted on May 13 to recommend that the town manager reject all bill bids um, the bid that we received was seven million over the estimate. Um, that one bid amount would have meant that the fundraisers would need to raise not just the seven million that they needed to raise at that at the time that we approved a forty six million dollar project, but it's now actually uh, would they would need to raise fourteen million dollars, um, not including some additional design services associated with a later bid date. So that comes back around then to sort of the billing committee itself. Um, 
as part of that as part of that conversation though the chair of the trustees asked their subcommittee the building and facility committee to take up a repair scenario and to develop an estimate of work to be done with a schedule uh, and they talked about reaching out to Kuhn Riddle for a, a cost of repair uh, estimate. So the the Jones Library Building Committee meeting itself on May 7, uh, we received essentially the same option list that um, the town manager provided to the council, that being one, rebid something at a later date, uh, two, tear down the project cost, and three, ask for more money and accept the bid. Now, number two, which is paring down the project cost, uh, the architect did say they can't shave off $7 million. So when I think about that, it means that the cost cutting would, would essentially eliminate furniture, fixtures, equipment from the, from the bid package. Those elements would have to come back to a JCPC uh, conversation at another time in, in the future. Um, uh, it was also of note that the that the building committee did approve an invoice for the owner's project manager through the end of March, um, but it became apparent that they have actually exceeded their fee for um, for the con for the design and bid phase of things, and they were starting to eat into their fee for the construction services, which obviously hasn't happened. So these are all sort of rolling and, and imploding costs. Um, there is a discussion, there was a discussion at the building committee meeting about rebidding this project at a later date. And I just need to recognize that there would be costs to the town for extending the bid date. And namely that would be design time to go find cost savings and the cost of interest on the MBLC loan. Anna. Pam, I appreciate the detailed update. I'm curious if the committee has discussed any other cost estimations regarding the uh, option of just run uh, any other option, because I think we don't have updated numbers on that. And so I wasn't sure if that was something that the committee has ever discussed, because I think it's hard to compare do things when we don't, that hasn't been done for a couple of years. That's exactly right. So even, even having two or three different options presented, there are no, there are no facts or budgets associated with any of them. Okay. So, so at this point, um, until the smaller committee perhaps gets back and does a repair estimate, we don't even know what that is. We, we know right. what numbers there were a couple of years ago, but not current. Okay. Thank you. Kathy, I, I'm sorry, Jennifer Top. Um, so I'm maybe skipping to the um, trustees meeting because I I've listened to the last couple of trustees meetings and today they voted to send a letter to the MBLC requesting an extension since they voted to reject the bid. And one of my questions is, is the trustees authorized to do that or would that be the town sending the letter? Because if the 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 initial payment that the MBLC made came to the town, right? Not the trustees or the friends of the Jones. So wouldn't the agreement have to be with the town if we're going to extend the bid period? So it would be, it's both that the trustees received the grant and but the town receives the money. So it's a joint decision. So would the letter be joint? Because any costs incurred if the if it goes out to bid again, would be the town's cost. So what, shouldn't the council be involved in that? So th that's not been determined yet. Who would pay if there is there if there if there's going to be an extension, and there's going to be work additional work, there will be more costs incurred. It's not been determined who would pay those additional costs. Um, so in the letter to the MBLC would have to come from the town manager and the chair of the trustees. So at what point will the council? I mean, I would seem the council would need to be involved in the conversation. The council is involved if there's an appropriation requested. So if there's an extension and the library doesn't assume those costs, would 
then would you come to the council and? Um, it, it depends where the costs are going to, how they're going to be paid for. So if the trust, so there's different ways that that cost can be handled. And I would report that back to the council. And if there's a council action required, then yes, the council would have to act on it. Now, if um, the bid, if we don't go forward, or if we go out to bid again and the bid is higher than we can than our budget, and that the grant that's in, that's already been given from the MBLC, if that has to be paid back with interest, is that the town paying that? So there is a memorandum of agreement between the town and the trustees about that about a sum of money for that. Um, I think I've shared that with you, but if, I, if not, I can mm -hmm. I can share that with you again. Um, and so that's laid out that the trustees have committed, I think it's $1.82 million or something like that. And it, and the way it's set up is that it wouldn't go back to MBLC, but they would not be, it would be funds that they would normally request through the C, uh, JCPC process to repair the buildings. But we they, they would commit to putting that money from their endowment into the building immediately. Okay, so, but my question is, if we don't move forward with construction, the two point seven million dollars. That's a town liability, plus interest. Yeah. So okay, so this also becomes part of my question: If we haven't spent all that money, so if we didn't go forward, we would have to pay back, you know, what's already been spent plus interest. But if we if we go forward six months and then we still can't go to construction, then we've probably spent all the money. So I think one of the strategies we wouldn't would engage in is to tell the MBLC that we had pursued this project in good faith and that they should be give that the amount they gave us. And we would lobby hard for them to do that. That's not a guarantee that they would. Um, but I think that, that we would have a very strong argument for why they should. And I think our legislative delegation would support us on that. So, but ultimately, but ultimately you're right. It is a town responsibility at this point in time. Um, but we would look at other means. If the project doesn't terminate now, and we, so right now we I've rejected the bid, so we don't have a project, and there's there's no additional cost being incurred at this point in time. If we're going to move forward and say we're going to do something different, we're going to have to create a contract to engage probably the design team to do something different, um, and then that's going to be a cost, and we're going to have to identify what that cost is. Um, and then, and I think that at the at the um, building committee meeting, I think that the designers did talk about that. Um, so, um, and then there's also there's other factors that come into play as well because there's construction escalation costs that go along with when you start don't start a, a project in July, you start it in whenever. Inflation is continuing. Um, there may there may be reduced costs if more bidders come into play. That's one of the things. There may be reduced costs if uh, the design is changed. Um, so there's there's different. Those are all the things that have to sort of play into this before that that decision is moved forward. But the first sort of hurdle is that the is if this is even an option is whether the MBLC is open to um, extending the grant beyond the deadline they already have. Was stated at the library that the, that question came up at the trustees meeting today, and apparently the library director, I believe, had received feedback that the MBLA does. M Could you please speak into your the mic? MBLC doesn't really have anything to lose by granting the extension because the money does have to be paid back within 60 days with interest. So, I guess what the library director, I believe that's who was speaking, um, said that she had every reason to believe after speaking to the MBLC that the extension would be granted. Okay. I'll take that for, yeah. Um, Kathy. Um, as Lynn knows, I had asked this to be on the agenda tonight, and she said we couldn't, we couldn't because we didn't have any options. There appear to be some options being discussed, so I request that this be on the next council meeting agenda, which is June 3rd, with sufficient time to lay out for us what, what sounds to me high financial risk for the town of Amherst taxpayers with very little of the risk right now in the library because once we're at this level of higher costs, it's more than their total endowment. 
So we, we really are in a backs against the wall. So I would just like a, a enough time for a full discussion. And one other piece that I would like to have be part of it, and I know Paul and you and Pam are both on the building committee. My understanding from reading press coverage rather than from getting reports is that there's a possibility of going back to Coon Riddle for and working with people around a plan B. And I would hope that we don't just gloss over old numbers, that we really do a look at the civil engineering, the HVAC. The last time we did, I, I think Cool Grill was great, but last time all they did was add on the accessibility piece and they took the Western Builders estimate from 2017, 2018 for the roof and the HVAC. I think we need to have another real look at that. And I don't know where the money for that comes from. I know we've got a lot of skilled people in town, but just some laying out of how we would have a really good estimate um, with a design team. So I'll stop there, but on June 3rd, the other pieces were holding $1.2 million in the JCP report in your capital plan for the assumption that we've gone out for a bond and that's the carrying costs on the bond. So there's a piece of money there that if we pivot could go toward this and we've got a window to reapply to C the CPAC because they take new proposals starting September 1st. So we might, if we're doing a repair, renovate, we might be able to get money if someone applies for it. So we're, this is all in a time crunch. So I'd like at least some of that to be in a full discussion on June 3rd. We don't have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Pam. Thank you. I'd, I'd uh, appreciate these comments that are being made. Um, I would ask the town manager that, you know, you mentioned that you might have to procure the services of design, um, design folks to do something to get another package prepared. And I understand that. Um, if, if the decision is to go forward to um, bid, bid the same project essentially at a, at a later date, I would, I would ask that uh, part of this conversation be that the trustees pays for the design time to do this reworking rather than the town. Those are all costs, including the interest to MBLC uh, with a delayed bid. Op bid. Um, those are all costs to the town. So far, I've not heard that the, the trustees are on the hook for any of these additional costs. Okay. George, you had your hand up. I hesitate to get too deeply into this. Um, I am sort of trying to figure out what our role is here. Um, we have uh, made, we've entered into a memorandum of understanding, I believe, is that right? With the uh, trustees. And we, we authorized the town manager to enter right. into and a so MOA. And so that has been done. And um, we are still waiting to see or hear what they plan to do. So uh, until we get an answer, uh, I'm trying to get a sense of what we're going to do when this goes on the agenda. Um, so I guess I'll just have to wait and find out. Um, there's a very strong desire and good reason to rebid this. Um, and there are some people who clearly don't want it rebid. Um, clearly, um, the town can't be on the hook for the costs I agree with you. Um, at the moment, we don't have an understanding of what uh, is going to happen. And obviously, we want to find out. Uh, but until we find out, I'm not sure what we're going to be talking about, um, other than people making complaints about what they like or don't like about the process. Um, only one bid was uh, returned. The, the view was, from the people who do this for a living, that the timing was poor. Please speak into your mic. The view from the uh, professionals was that the timing was poor and that taking a second bite at the apple actually makes some sense. Um, so why don't we see what happens? Councillor Haneke. 
Um, I echo George's, I guess, confusion as to what, but I mean, we could certainly talk about a lot, but because we all have opinions, we're, <laughs> we're on a council. Um, but if there's no action of the council being requested, I, it would just be 13 people talking about something they have no vote on. And I'm, I, I don't know whether that's helpful or not. Um, but I, I do hope that the manager is carefully scouring the contract with the OPM regarding payments, especially if we've paid more than the contract says, and especially if bid documents need reworked after we already went out to bid to ensure that the OPM followed the contract for the first set of bid documents, because if the OPM didn't and set out to bid bid documents that weren't ready, the OPM should be on the hook for the additional costs to get those bid documents ready for a second bid, not the town, not the trustees. We need to make sure that contract is being followed and if not, I think we need to be stronger on in, you know, in, in making that sure. But that's, again, not something the council really has a say in, but it just, I think we need to be really, as a town manager, scrutinizing the compliance with contracts that have been signed. Uh, Pam? Yeah, just the, the fact that we are discussing it tonight uh, in part is because I asked for it to be on the agenda on May 6, and I was told, well, we can talk about it during the town manager report, and then we'll put it on the agenda for the next meeting. The next meeting is tonight. It was not on the agenda again, and again, we were told, I was told, I don't know who else was told, um, that we could discuss it during the town manager report. So I think part of this is frustration because we don't have actual numbers to talk about. We don't really know what the options are and we don't know what the cost ramifications are to the town. Even if we don't know the actual numbers, it should be spelled out. These are the elements that should be part of any consideration for option one. These are the elements that should be part of option two and at least lay it out for people rather than just talking around it for the last month. Jennifer? Yes, I agree. I, I think, I, I mean, constituents are asking all the time about the library and to be on the council and say, well, I haven't really gotten much information. So I have been tuning into the trustees meetings and the building committee meetings when I can. And we do know that the trustees today said they are going to re request an extension and assuming that it's granted, there will be costs to go out to bid again. So yes, I agree with Councillor Haneke. We should know, was there something about the bid documents that went out that is causing us to have to rebid it? Um, but there, and if we, from what I've read, that there have already been um, invoices paid from construction phase costs because the budget for design and bid has already been exhausted for certain of the contractors. So this is appropriately, I think, a council concern and it's something we should be discussing. And to say, well, we don't know where we're going. We know that we will, that the request is being made from the MBLC to allow us to continue after June 30th when we, at this point, are supposed to be breaking ground. So I think the council, we should have a discussion and we should be informed as to what the costs are going forward. Kathy? I, I'll just, I can't tell you how many people are asking why we're not talking about it. So that's why I want it on the agenda. But George, I was elected to be fiscally accountable to taxpayers. This is a huge risk that we're looking at. And at least for us to understand the risk, I can't help it that we don't even own the building and that there's another group called trustees but I, I wouldn't accept this if this was going on in the school building. I would expect us to take action if it looked like we were about to exceed. There we've got another entity called MBLC that for schools that's really sitting there looking at every document that we process. Um, so I, th I think we have to understand 
what we're looking at in terms of financial risk to the town, to our to our coffers, since we want to seem to want to spend the same money on different things, and we only have so much money. Um, we're we're just going to have to confront it, and the sooner we can at least understand what the mag magnitudes of the financial risk are, the better. It's on the agenda for June 3rd. I'll get back to what I need from you before then. Thank you. George. Okay, thank you. Um, Town services and outreach, Andy. Yes, uh, I think the uh, most important news from the last report. I can't hear you, Andy. Uh, the most important news from since the last report is that uh, we had uh, we had to cancel our meeting of May 16, which was the meeting that we intended to discuss the waste hauler bylaw, and there were a couple of reasons that were uh, the reason to postpone the uh, discussion, but one of them is that. Uh, the committee uh, really does need the actual responses to the request for information about um, the that were provided by different three different uh, haulers, so that we can see the entire thing and not just the summary and any contracts that were obtained uh, by our staff as they were um, looking at the RFIs. So we're hoping that we uh, actually, it's more beyond hope, we've made a very urgent request that they be provided in advance. Um, the next meeting, when we're gonna be able to take this up again, and uh, uh, I will be proposing to the committee is June 13. Um, and so I'm hoping um, that we can get all of the uh, people back into the meeting, and I think that we can on June 13 to have that discussion and that we have the um, information that we've requested in advance and that be available uh, to the public um, because I think that it is public information. Uh, the uh, May 30 uh, meeting uh, is really devoted entirely to other matters and is gonna take up more time then uh, would be uh, we would not be able to add it to that meeting because uh, we really are very committed to uh, try and examine issues that we've discussed before about speed limits, um, traffic calming, uh, street safety, uh, and uh, uh, address the uh, Henry Street and Heatherstone Road issues. Uh, we also understand that uh, we're going to be receiving a petition from um, a fifth grade class at the Fort River School that wants us to uh, look at the uh, issues that have to do with safe routes to school for bicycles. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, where we are for the next two meetings now. Kathy? Uh, Andy, um I don't know, given your meeting schedule, how you would squeeze this in, but it would be good the same way you had DPW come in on um, how they set priorities for which road gets done when, you know, on a list. Uh, we need something like that on sidewalks as well. There, I had, Brecca and I both got an earful yesterday on a, a, what whatever happened to the TAC plan on not just safe routes to school, but there was a whole plan on sidewalks and walkability and DPW signed off on it. So the East Pleasant Street sidewalk was on the list, top rated. And then we suddenly saw Heatherstone getting sidewalks where there are none or repairs. So I would just request that you bring DPW in and you let us know when they're coming. And how do we set, are there priorities for which sidewalks are on the list for doing when? 
and what is the criteria that guide those? Um, because, well, Lynn was at the meeting too. There was a lot of frustration. And then just making one more comment. When we hear about a multi-use sidewalk, I strongly suggest that some council members get out with a bicycle and, a, and walking to look at what we're talking about and decide whether it's worth the money. They're not very wide and they're scarily dangerous and they're really expensive. So just, just trying to think of where we're spending our money with priority setting. So it was, it's a request that of priority setting that I think would be useful to hear. And I don't know when you're gonna schedule it in. Um, it goes with traffic calming clearly and safe routes to school. So at some point, a fuller discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Pam Rooney. Um, Kathy finally hit on the topic I was going to touch on, and that was that um, if we're setting priorities, I had hoped that TSO would ask DPW or the town manager to, to set up those traffic safety zones, the, the, the touch points in town where there are traffic concerns and get them on a priority list so that we know when they're gonna be addressed kind of in order. I think last year, um, JCPC decided not to fund the private requests that came in, um, but if, if you're gonna have that system, then have your list ready to go so that you can address these things. That's a really important one. Andy? Yeah, no, I appreciate you, the suggestions that have been made. Um, the, uh, in the question of sidewalks um, is being multi-use paths, I think is an important issue that um, we need to get better advice from Transportation Advisory Committee on two, because there's a question of safety and it actually is raised in the fifth grade request from Ford River because the, they uh, are looking for safe routes to school and want to be able to ride on sidewalks in areas that are other than town center. Um, and uh, that um, may in conflict with uh, what the uh, disability either Access Advisory Committee or Commission um, believes is an appropriate thing for the interests of um, the people that they're looking to, to protect and represent. Um, so it's a difficult issue. As far as the Heatherstone Road sidewalk, we did re ask that question when we discussed the um, Heatherstone Road proposal with DPW and we was pointed out that this was a question for that very limited section of widening the road and are actually not widening the road, narrowing the road and using part of the width for sidewalk and doing it as a part of road that was being repaved anyway, so that it was not additional money that was coming is um, at the expense of sidewalks elsewhere, uh, but was just being part of a general project. Um, but that's really a very limited set of issues that um, can can arise um, for for sidewalks. And I think that the question of priorities that um, Councilor Shane has uh, suggested we take up. Is, is an important issue and one that I appreciate having been raised. Great. Uh, George, you have your hand up. So like many things, it really does seem to come back to money. So Paul in his memo today mentioned that we have a $47.5 million backlog in paving. And currently, according to the JCPC memo of April 15th, we're spending 1.34 million a year now in paving. Now uh, that's a $500,000 reduction from the million that we were giving. So if you do the math, that'll take us 35 years to catch up with our backlog. So I think people need to start getting real. You might as well look your constituents in the eye and say, look, you can have all the 
priorities you want and you can make all the lists you want, but there is just no money there. And often when sidewalks get done, it's because they're doing paving there. And so they have the sidewalk in. It's not like there's a special sidewalk plan that Guilford's working on alongside of the special paving plan. He doesn't have a he doesn't have enough money to do it. So as long as we continue to not provide the funds, I don't quite see the point. We might as well just tell our constituents, in fact, we're reducing the amount of money we're spending on road pavement for the next future ongoing, 500000 a year. And if you can wait 35 years, we'll finally catch up with our backlog. Bob Hagner. Yeah, I just want to mention that, uh, let's not forget, when we're talking about sidewalks and, and routes to school, you have to think about snow clearance and issues associated with that. So we should just bear that in mind. Okay. Um, it, about a month and a half ago, we appointed people as liaisons. Are there any liaison reports? Pat. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I just want to say how grateful I am to the council um, for making uh, DACA a um, commission. Uh, the folks on that committee have been working for uh, five years. Well, I've been liaison probably for five years, four and a half years, and I've seen an incredible growth and change in the people in the committee um, and the work of Marty Smith and Myra Ross uh, and Pamela Nolan Young in terms of really bringing the issues forward to the planning board, to DPW, and working on being heard, which is still complex and not always, uh, doesn't always really happen. So um, they're just an amazing group of people. So, and thank you. Thank you. Are there any other liaison comments or reports? Okay. Uh, we approved the minutes on the consent agenda. Uh, Paul, there's no written town manager report now, but do, any comments you want to make? Well, I think we covered a lot of things that I was going to talk about. Um, and um, you'll have a written report next week, ne next meeting. Okay. Uh, are there questions of Paul at this time? Jennifer. Um, I just wanted to ask if... Please um, lean into the yeah, mic. If at the next meeting or in your report, um, we received... The council received an email from a chief um, operations division head at the um, DPW regarding the wastewater treatment plant and a notice of noncompliance. So just if we could maybe get a status report on whether the concerns in the notice have been satisfied. And then this is more just for the council. Uh, the person, the DPW um, staff invited the council to visit the wastewater treatment plant. And I would like to you know, volunteer um, to try and set up such a meeting. I could send out a, what, doodle calendar. But I think both as, um, in response as courtesy and for our own edification, it, we would do well to visit. Usually when we do those kinds of visits, we try to arrange them so that the council has, you know, one or two dates that they might go. So I'll work with the town manager on visiting. That is one of the places we've never visited. Yeah, no, you, you really should. I hope that you will be, it, it is, yeah. if you're willing to give time, it's a terrific thing to see and smell. Um, and it's, but it's a, a amazing, there's a full lab there. Um, you know, I just, you know, there are, uh, non-compliance issues are often usually just things where, where we exceeded a level and they have to, report. it's a mandatory reporting thing that happens. Um, not infrequently, I'll say, um, and and so I think you know the the um, you should if we will arrange for a, a visit at some point because it is really I, I find one of the more fascinating places, and it's a place again you're going to hear people say that it needs more investment. You know, it's like almost everything in our town. Um, there's there's the request is going you know there's going to be requests for investment into that facility um, because it needs it and we have this pressure of not increasing our sewer fees too much with, with making an unfair bur you know, an undue burden on property owners. Um, and also trying to retain quality uh, employees and all the things that come into it. And, you know, he's part of union leadership, so they have an agenda as well. But I think that this really is about 
helping to share their story about what's going on in the plant. And I, if you could all go or as many as possible, I would, they would, it really makes a big difference to employees to feel that they, that you're looking at what they're seeing, what they're seeing on a daily basis. They're terrific, really highly qualified employees. Um, so it really, we'll, we'll set something up. We'll get a couple of dates. They, so because one date isn't going to meet everybody's needs. We'll try and get a couple of times right. and they would be so thrilled for you to be there. Honestly. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Ete, you had your hand up. That was one of the things I was going to bring up. And actually, um, I think the invitation had already been extended to me several months um, before. So I'm glad to know that it's going to be taken up by the council. Great. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions of the town manager? Uh, you had a president's report in your packet. Are there any questions? Uh, Councilor Ette. The very last point um, deals with housing at UMass and Amherst College. Yes. And it says the town should make it clear that housing is an aspiration and goal with both UMass and Amherst College. And it goes on. This was very cryptic to me. So if that could be explained a bit more. Be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll be glad to, um, but also the town manager and uh, Vice President uh, Devlin Gothier was all, were also at the meeting. So one of the questions that we brought up, in fact, it was Pam Rooney asked that we um, continue to bring up the issue of housing with our state representatives and senator. So we had as part of our monthly meeting with them, we had that discussion, they suggested that we, you know, set up a time to meet with UMass. Now, interestingly enough, the UMass agreement has the requirement that we're supposed to meet regularly and that we you specifically talked with both them and Amherst College about housing issues and housing issues in terms of what we would like to see and so forth. Then they tied this to the housing bill that's going through the legislature at this time. And particularly in that bill, there is an emphasis on the potential to use state land for housing. And that was also brought up as one of the things that we should discuss, particularly in this case would be UMass because they're the ones with the state land. I'm gonna ask either uh, Paul or Anna, whether either of you want to add anything else to that. Um, the only thing I wanted to add is, is a bit tangential, which is I think one of the things that our state legislators have asked us for is to bring them things that we as a council have been engaging in and discussing. Mm -hmm. And this is one that while it's a really good topic and it's really valid, we as a council haven't actually had that conversation and come to a conclusion recently to my recollection. And so I think one of my things that I'd like to do is figure out how to make sure that we get something on the agenda before we then bring it to our legislators so that we're bringing a concern from the body, not from several individual counselors, because I think, again, this is a valid topic that we should be discussing, but we should discuss it before we're asking our state legislators to spend time on it. So I just wanted to remind everybody that we we got that nudge from them of, you know, individual counselors are welcome to reach out to them as their reps. But when we have the meetings with them with Paul, that's for us to bring forward things that the council is as, as a body, right? We are representing that body. Um, and so I think that was something as we are collecting topics going forward, I'd, I'd like us to either ask, maybe we can ask earlier so that something can get on an agenda to be discussed before we bring it forward, or I'm not sure what the solution is, but um, I think part of why that sam seemed cryptic it, in, in my mind too, if I read this report without context is that we hadn't talked about it first as, as this body. So I think that's important for us going forward. This council, meaning this council seated in January has not talked yes, about it. Yes, that's what I mean. But we talked about it extensively, particularly as with the comprehensive housing policy. Right, so, but I don't, I mean, right. we haven't taken a stand on it other than our support of the of the housing bill and, and support of like right. things like that. And I think that's, it's important to that's correct. be clear. 
Are there any other questions or comments? Let me just take this down. Uh, Pat. I, I really want to encourage the council to uh, address housing, to begin to talk about housing, to review the comprehensive housing policy. But when we do that, I think that we really need to have the uh, housing trust be part of those conversations because they're, you know, they, they, they carry in a wealth of information and a hands-on and on-the-ground understanding of a situation. Um, and, you know, it's almost like I want to call for a retreat to discuss housing, not the, you know, let's, let's make time to do that and um, instead of some of the things we make time for. Uh, Paul, I, I'm sorry, I didn't come back to you to add further clarification to that. that that's fine. Uh, it all builds on. So if you recall, a couple weeks ago, I was invited to meet with the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of housing and livable communities, a small group of municipal officials, and they really want to hear what are the barriers to creating housing. And there's a lot of discussion about affordable housing, where, which we have a lot of experience with. And I think one of the reasons we got invited is that we're pretty good on, on those things. Um, and um, and, and it's, it's the cost per unit and all, all the, um, the, the length of time it takes to get state funding and get permitting, all those things. Um, but the governor said explicitly that housing is the number one issue for the Commonwealth and the biggest barrier to economic development. The biggest group of people who are leaving the Commonwealth are 25 to 36 year olds, mostly because of the cost of housing. So creating affordable housing, yes. Creating more housing, period, is, is the priority. Uh, um, just because there aren't the units aren't there to accommodate the people who want to live. And Amherst is a prime example because there are a lot of people who want to live in the town of Amherst. And we're doing well. We actually pitch the amount of development we have for that when we go to our bond rating agency to say we're a thriving community um, because it shows with the um, building starts. But that, um, you know, uh, and they've, they've, the state has done a lot of research on it. And one thing, um, I'm not opining on this, but the, the Lieutenant Governor said it's the one thing that made a big difference in California was the ADU, when they passed ADU as a, as a right, that that's the, that's the single thing that created the most housing um, of any law that was passed in, 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 in California. And if, if the goal is to create housing, that is one of the tools that is available. Yeah, understood. Yeah. Pat, you still have your hand up? I'm sorry. I want to make a comment, but I think it would be better if I kept my mouth closed. Okay. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, so let me just talk about future agendas. Uh, on June 3rd, at this point, we're planning the public forum on the capital improvement plan. That will be a separate meeting followed by the regular town council meeting. On that agenda, I have now added the Jones Library. Um, we're, uh, we have a written town manager's report. Andy mentioned the petition from the Fort River School students. I've received a return email from them and they actually would like to bike during the day. And so I'm going to try to set up a time and if other counselors can join me, they would like to kind of ceremonially, if you will, bike to town hall and present us with their petition. But obviously they're not gonna do that at 6.30 at night, so. I have some bikers who will join you. <laughs> right. Um, and uh, Heather Stone Road, I hope will would be ready by next, by June 3rd. Mandy Joe, you have your hand up. I also then have some lists for the 17th and the 24th, but go ahead. Are we ever gonna do any follow-up on the retreat? I'm sorry. We had a council retreat over a month ago. Are we ever going to do any follow-up on that? I, thank you. I actually started putting together the follow-up and then got interrupted and never got back to it, but thank you. Um, I can do that for the third. Uh, Andy. Just wanted to uh, make sure that we all remember that I think we have a public hearing tomorrow. Thank you. At 6.30 and it's virtual. I'll be polling you to make sure we have a quorum. Are there any other questions or comments? So on June 17th, we get back to the track and field and 
hopefully we'll have appointments for the Charter Review Committee and the Finance Committee. And then on June 24th, we will, are scheduled to adopt the budget uh, and the capital improvement plan uh, appointments by town manager and the council appointments of uh, planning board, I believe is we've done ZBA, but the planning board is still open. Okay. And minutes of executive sessions. So any other comments? I just wanted to follow up on the hearing that Andy mentioned in case people are confused. It is a hearing by charter required of the finance committee. So Lynn's comment about requiring or making sure there's a quorum of the council is not no. a quorum of the council is not necessary, although the council is, I believe it's noticed as a council meeting in case counselors want to attend, but it is a public hearing officially of the finance committee to satisfy charter requirements. That is correct. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Then I'd like to hear, have a second for a motion to, oh, I'm sorry, Fred, oh. uh, attorney, uh, Councillor Ette, you just got promoted to attorney on top of <laughs> um, Councillor Ette. Yeah, I just, uh, I think, um, We've had some issues in town, especially, for example, the library that have heeded the conversation. And I just wanted to say, I don't think it's helpful when we trade babs in the community. Um, and I, I would like those who really care about the issues, regardless of what side you are on, to use your best judgment in making a case for why your side should prevail. And I want to appreciate the council not being drawn into those kind of barbed attacks, you know, so, um, but this is me speaking towards the community. Um, let's refrain from heating the temperature beyond what it already is. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or uh, councilor comments at this time? Then I'm making a motion to adjourn. Seek a second. 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 Devlin got there. Okay. And we'll move to a vote. And we start with Councilor Walker. Yes. Did I miss somebody? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin got there. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, and I, Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Jennifer Taub. Yes. It's unanimous. Meetings adjourned. <laughs>